Hello, and thank you so much for joining us. At this time, you are in a listen-only mode. You may ask questions at any time via the Q&A box on your screen. All participants can vote on questions submitted to ensure the most popular questions are answered live. After the presentations, we will move into the interactive sessions. To join these sessions, please click the link that will be shown on the screen and placed into the chat box. This session is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Michele Ferranta. Please go ahead. Good morning, everybody. My name is Michele Ferranta, and I work at the National Institute of Mental Health. Today, we're going to talk about dynamic interactive data visualizations. And uh, I have a presentation that I would like to share with you. So I work at the National Institute of Mental Health, and uh, I am the program director for the Computational Neuroscience Program and the Computational Psychiatry Program. One is in the Division of Basic Science and Basic Neuroscience, and the other one is in the Division of Translational Neuroscience. Uh, uh, this workshop is a two part. Um, the first one happened two days ago and uh, was uh, run by uh, our, my, my colleague, Abera Wanjui. Um, the, the main goal of this um, workshop is to showcase dynamic and interactive data visualization for new behavioral data. We're going to have a pack agenda, and uh, the main uh, things that we're going to go through is like showing um, all of you um, how we can use these figures in papers and in grants for uh, to, to actually submit to, have, to uh, have more uh, dynamic interactions with the, both the figures interacting with the readers and the figures interacting with each other and um, showcase dense and multidimensional um, trajectories for neurobehavioral data, um, figures that can show exploration of model parameters or the phenotyping of mental health cohort. Uh, the idea would be to identify potential use case and gaps um, for these tools in uh, mental health, both in basic, in translational, and in service and intervention research. So I'm not sure if uh, our research director is online right now. So I will introduce him probably at the end of the talk at this point. Um, so um, it's the 10th year anniversary for our talk. And uh, uh, one of the things that I've been recently asked was to uh, reimagine our doc um, through the use of this uh, new data science technology. The reason, is the, the, the main goal of this presentation is of this workshop is basically to move our figures to what's on the top, which is a figure that requires a lot of labels and requires a lot of explanations to the figure on the bottom. So the figure on the bottom is more dynamic and capture the whole phenomenon uh, in a much clearer way. In order to do this, a couple of things will be necessary. One is to um, change basically uh, what the, our, the current framework for our doc in a way that actually at the moment, as you probably, if you're familiar with our doc, there are, it's pretty much the format of an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, where there is like on the left side of the domains of function and on the top, there are units of analysis. Um, it also encompasses such as gene molecule circuits. It also encompasses concept as neurodevelopmental, uh, neurodevelopment and uh, environment. Um, so in order for us to um, make this change, we require two concepts. Basically the addition of time and the addition of function that function that will be able to connect things in the matrix. So why this is necessary? So it's, we are spending, NIMH is spending a lot of money and resources and time on uh, collecting more dense multidimensional data that are continuous and longitudinal. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, an interesting concept that like uh, we collect this data and still we are actually showing them in a static way. Why this is so important? It's only about like the way the data looks, not really. Like it's also about the fact that uh, we can actually have a true impact. This is, for instance, an, uh, a success story from an HLBI. Uh, it would be great to have like some example like this in a couple of years, probably, uh, at an IMH. 
uh, where we could add, we could actually build uh, parametric models uh, for risk predictions, and those models can actually lead to dynamic decisions uh, that can uh, that the clinicians can use in uh, in their office. So, in order to make this change, we need to uh, understand something that um, that is obvious, but like is almost never uh, represented in our uh, articles. The fact that actually our measures change over time. So for instance, if we give a task, take a task, uh, today we might get a score, the day after we might get another score. If uh, this um, scores change over time, the matrix that I showed you before that was previously an Excel spreadsheet can change to something like this. So what, why this is a better version in my view of the current matrix? Because the arches here, each one of these arches, actually is quantitative. So it can represent whatever quantity we, we want to represent of our doc. It can be task scores, it can be bibliometric information, dollar spends, an amount of grants funded. Um, it could, uh, each circle amounts to uh, a one because that's all the information that we have about that knowledge. And uh, we can expand and collapse the, the arches for us to actually reveal all the different concepts in the matrix and explore more in depth. Uh, by design, there are empty spaces here that shows like uh, all the um, concepts that were not previously represented, uh, that are, they are not currently included in the matrix, like almost like saying, hard doc like constructs that are not being uh, explored yet, or they are not still yet in the matrix can actually be inserted in this empty spaces. So this is like, as I said, it's quantitative, but it's not relational still. Um, so in order to make it relational, we actually need to build the connections between these uh, constructs. And um, you can imagine that each one of these lines represent a theory. So there is reinforcement learning, for instance, or diffusion drift models that can connect the different constructs in the matrix and allow us to make predictions and classifications. So what this framework would change would basically allow us to have a quantitative and relational view of the matrix. These are all, I should say that all of these uh, examples are all um, made up data. Uh, so none of this is, uh, is just like uh, examples of how we could use these tools if we had them available for our publication. Another interesting um, um, type of visualization uh, could be like, uh, uh, this is like a, a representation of a real world evidence for our doc. Imagine that, uh, we have different type of interventions. And uh, over time, these interventions are actually, um, our uh, US population is switching from one intervention to the next, it stays with the same intervention. So having this, and this can happen as function of a new interventions get discovered, the policy change, uh, trends in uh, our clinic, in our mental health practitioners, um, so it would be more interesting if uh, something like this could be actually used as primary figure in, uh, in an article, for instance, or when you submit grants. So as I showed at the beginning, this, as I showed, as I showed before, these are population level data, but the same type of uh, representation can be used at the individual level, where uh, in this case, we're tracking how uh, individual dots are individual people switch from one activity to the next during the day. And um, you can imagine that this could enable like next generation, for instance, uh, clinical trials in which you actually give an intervention and you can see at the large uh, population level how the activity of those subjects during the day changed, like with things like uh, uh, sleep, leisure, activity, uh, um, personal care um, and things that are like uh, uh, more or less related to uh, mental health constructs. 
So another concept that I find that I found particularly useful for this uh, dynamic data visualization is the ability to connect uh, figures within the paper. So imagine that you have something that is at the individual level here on top and something that is at the population level. And you want to see while you read the paper where the individual level data maps into the population level. So this kind of tool will allow you to actually connect and show, for instance, for each one of the individual level, what is the strength and the significance of that correlation. And it could, it could allow you also to go from the individual to, to the population level and see where at the individual level that group is represented. So obviously this will be a, a big step for us uh, in the way that actually we enable um, our readers to understand our data. That said, um, most of our um, data still in mental health is focused on the first top two uh, levels of analysis, which is behavior and um, brain signals most of the time. Um, obviously, there is a lot more that could uh, uh, be studied and be modeled in relation to mental health. Um, the, the thing that like is uh, needs to be understood is the fact that actually, although all these descriptions might be uh, me very mechanistic, uh, they obviously end up affecting um, things that are like at a much higher level. So population level changes um, that I was describing before when I was describing transitions between uh, different interventions, for instance. So how do you do this? The way that you would do this is like you collect data and you make mathematical function grow from those uh, data collections. Once you have those mathematical functions for each one of the domain of function of interest. So imagine in this case, this is my recording for uh, an RDOC measurement. And uh, it tends like I record them myself for say one month and uh, I happen to be bimodal. <laughs> Uh, whether like uh, um, uh, in the way that my functioning uh, is distributed for a specific domain of function, let's say executive function, for instance. Uh, the reasons why something like this would be interested is interesting is because in the moment that you start collecting large data, you can actually in the paper itself start exploring like, uh, so if I score in this range, what are the people that score like me scoring in other range of domain of function? So this is positive valence, this is negative valence, this is sensory motor. Knowing the score in one range can allow you to predict um, how people like you will score in other range. So this is while reading the paper. So that will be like, uh, from my perspective, um, a way to actually, for, for, for the readers, for us to discover a lot more uh, while we're reading the paper. Another uh, good representation is the idea of uh, most of our measures that actually look like this. They go up and down in a random, uh, pseudo random um, way uh, over time. Uh, but the idea is like, it would be nice to actually uh, identify dimensions that can explain um, that chaotic, um, the chaotic rhythm with the, uh, something that actually uh, can be modeled. Um, so it's uh, the, the reason why something like this would be interested, interesting in a paper is because it's basically imagine that like in a paper, you will have like a textbook like this. This is the Lorentz attractor. It's a three parameter model. Uh, you can imagine like, oh, that's that would be interesting, but like I would like to see how this model will change while I change one of these three parameters, you can actually, in the paper itself, enter the other, uh, input the other parameter and see how the Lorentz attractor will change and how the patient population would ideally change the, their dynamics in this multidimensional space. So it would be interesting to give um, patients a more complex type of um, stimuli and we will have several examples of this like such as movies and uh, uh, real life type of stimuli that might be um, labeled with different types of uh, in this case colors represents different domain of our doc function you can imagine that there is you give forest gum there are like uh, uh, 
since there are social, since there are positive valence, since there are negative valence. Once you run different people against a match population, you might see that there are significant difference in the way that like uh, in the parameters of this model and uh, this um, difference can be represented with graph theory and uh, the, the graph would actually suggest where uh, the next generation circuit intervention could be um, tested. So of course you don't need the brain. Uh, you can actually do this completely in behavior and uh, you could actually see uh, for instance, in this case, we are recording um, negative balance uh, digital activity in mental health patients in a, uh, in a city. Like, of course, like all of this is made up data, but just give a sense of how this tool could be used. Um, you could see, for instance, the uh, production and the emergence of and consumption of this uh, type of activity. And uh, you can actually see how this uh, positive valence or negative valence propagates both at the local level and at the global level. It doesn't need to be obviously geography, uh, but like it, just to give a sense that like it can be mapped in a space. Um, so this type of graphs can be like also particularly useful in case uh, we want to portray a multi-scale phenomena in which something is happening at a very, uh, early time uh, phase and in a very uh, refined uh, time and uh, like ends up affecting uh, large scale um, developmental processes. So in this case, I'm showing a phenomenon that uh, ends up happening around like the developmental time uh, in er early lifetime and it ends up affecting the development of a specific domain of function and you can imagine that like if you catch that switch uh, early on, you would be able to intervene in the plastic window and affect the outcome. Similar thing here, like I have like uh, um, uh, a few R doc domain of functions as dimensions, and I'm trying to connect here a biomarker for uh, that in this case is represented by the size of uh, um, the dot that is improving after treatment. And you can see that like uh, um, uh, over time here that is passing by this uh, dots improve improving function and uh, the patients move from a state of poor function here on the lower uh, left to a state of higher function here on the top right. So another um, things that is often represented, we're starting finally starting to collect longitudinal data and uh, in large sample sites. But like one thing that I think like is often missing is the fact that we are not able to um, disentangle um, developmental changes from uh, generational effects. Uh, so you can imagine that we're studying, for instance, ABCD right now, and uh, we're starting like uh, with a population that started maybe at nine years old and we follow them through until they become like uh, 20 years old. In that case, like uh, we will not be able to disentangle what is actually a developmental effect from what a, is a, a, a generational effect. And the reason for that is because uh, we are not continuing to recruit um, patients uh, as, as the, the, the time moves. If we are able to do something like this, we can actually show that the phenomenon that we can see, like uh, for instance, this uh, switch between biotype A and biotype B is moving over time, which suggests that this is actually a generational effect rather than uh, a developmental effect. So I introduce a few uh, concepts here regarding uh, RDoC and the way that it could be uh, represented. And uh, it's, uh, um, it's really uh, an exciting field for me and I would be happy to um, take any questions if there are in the, in the chat. And uh, if not, um, I would like to take a minute to, to um, check if to actually introduce our issue director. Um, Josh Gordon is the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, he oversees a large um, portion of uh, grants in, in our space. Mental health is the leading institute 
and is being a tremendous supporter for computational approaches. Hi, thanks, Michaela, and uh, for really was a thorough introduction to the day and uh, to everyone for joining us today. Um, I was meant to give these remarks before Michaela's talk, but I apologize. I was delayed by another meeting running over, um, but I really enjoyed uh, watching and literally watching the, um, the, his explication of uh, of what we're doing here today. I, I, let me just briefly add that I think, um, number one, there's a lot of interest in this area. We have an international audience um, and as well as international speakers. So I, I'll, I'll say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and maybe even good night for those of you who might be in the wee hours. Um, and uh, second, I wanted to say that uh, as Michaela suggested, the fact that we have opportunities now uh, to um, really change how we present scientific data um, with uh, the availability of web-based publishing methods, um, I think it, it's really exciting to imagine what we might be able to learn um, by visualizations uh, such as those that Michaela showed just now and, uh, and those that we'll be uh, visualizing uh, the rest of this meeting. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Michaela and uh, have him introduce the speakers and, and get us on our way. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Josh, for the kind introduction. Um, so it, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Janice Chang. Janice, uh, Janice uh, is an assistant professor at the Department of Psychology and Brain Science at John Hopkins University. She completed her uh, bachelor at MIT, her PhD at Stanford, and a postdoc at Princeton. She investigated neural systems, processes, and representation underlying human episodic memory uh, as it manifests in a uh, naturalistic setting and behaviors. Uh, she utilized dyna dynamic stimuli such as audiovisual movies and uh, interactive stories and daily life activity. Uh, such as spoken in conversation and web browsing. She's one of the four um, organized, uh, organized, uh, members of the organizing committee that is uh, appropriately dubbed um, DidBits for dynamically interactual data visualization. Thank you, Michaela. Um, I'm really looking forward to a great day of talks and tutorials today. This is a really exciting workshop. Um, so, uh, as Michaela said, I'm going to be talking about um, brain dynamics during movies uh, and naturalistic stimuli. So um, I work on human memory uh, and perception using behavioral and brain imaging methods, mainly functional magnetic resonance imaging. And today I'll be talking about how and why we use audiovisual movies and spontaneous speech to study the brain and how we depend on dynamic visualization for understanding and communicating our findings. So why do we use audiovisual movies and spontaneous speech to study the brain? Um, well, for decades now, most of brain imaging research in humans has relied on very simplified stimuli and randomized trials. These are very minimal stripped down experimental paradigms um, that we try to make clean and elegant. And scientists have to do this in order to control confounds and isolate specific variables that they want to study. But what we learn from simplified experiments is supposed to remain true in the real world too, uh, where things are complicated and messy. We always hope that our findings will scale up to apply to situations that people encounter in their normal lives, but um, we're often not sure that they will. Um, and that's why we sometimes have to do naturalistic experiments, where we try to create a laboratory experience that's less controlled, but much closer to normal life. And what we observe here could be surprising, and it could take us to places that we wouldn't have gone otherwise. Uh, I think that clean, elegant scientific experiments are extremely important. There are some things that we cannot learn without them. But I advocate for both of these approaches, and I hope that they can inform each other. So how do we study realistic experience in people who are trying to hold very still? We want to scan people's brains while they're having naturalistic experiences and remembering them. And that means that they won't be able to move. Um, so we emulate real world input using a movie. Um, and we elicit realistic behavior by asking people to speak freely about what they've seen. 
Cinematic movies um, have animated images and sounds, and they depict real environments and social situations and emotions. Because our stimuli and our behaviors are dynamic and the brain response is dynamic, oftentimes our understanding of the data benefits uh, from analyses and visualizations that capture those properties. Now, it turns out that when different people watch the same movie, their brain responses become synchronized. And this is a very useful tool for studying the brain. So here, here's what I mean by synchronized. Um, look at just one region of the brain. I'm circling early auditory cortex here. Auditory cortex produces a complex response time course while the movie is playing, uh, driven by the volume and different sound textures in the movie audio. And that complex response time course is the same across different people because everyone is hearing the same sound stream. If people are just lying in the scanner listening to nothing, you don't see synchrony across people in auditory cortex. Each part of the brain has its own response time course, depending on what features of the movie um, stimulus it cares about. And if you calculate this correlation across people for every part of the brain, you can make a map of synchrony across people. Uh, the correlation map is a static visualization of the synchronization across people's brains. It's a useful visualization. To see the brain activity that gives rise to those correlations, we can look at this um, animation of the raw fMRI signal. So each of these two images shows the average brain activity of two independent groups of people as they all watch the same movie. And in some regions, like here in visual cortex, um, you can clearly see how activity is mirrored across the two groups. You can see waves of activity moving and changing at the same time in the same direction. And if I slow this down and I break it into different movie scenes, you can see how each frame is different from the next, um, but similar across the two groups of people. Now, in this kind of intersubject analysis, one person's brain activity is the model for another person's brain activity. You don't know exactly what in the stimulus is driving the brain response, but you know how reliable the response is. So something in the stimulus evoked brain activity in this region, not necessarily a pulse of activity, but a consistent response. And this is how you examine what kinds of stimuli drive responses in any given brain region. In these kinds of experiments, we find that a non-visual stimulus does not drive visual cortex reliably, a non-auditory stimulus doesn't drive auditory cortex reliably, and so on. And so we probe the function of less understood brain regions by asking what conditions cause them to respond reliably um, and the reverse, and trying to build models for their activity from the natural stimuli themselves or from the produced behavior. The behavior that people produce in studies like this is often their speech. Um, after people watch a movie, for example, we could ask them um, to then talk about what they remember. And by collecting brain data as people spontaneously speak about their memories, we can study how and where brain patterns appear during recollection. Um, we can also examine the trajectories of the words themselves. And Jeremy is going to talk about this more in more detail um, in a couple of minutes. So using movies and stories and spontaneous speech has led scientists to a really exciting um, suite of findings about the human brain. Um, I'm listing a, a bunch of um, topic areas here. This is not a comprehensive list and I sincerely apologize to many people with excellent papers that are not on this slide. I focused more on recent papers and these are just some pointers for the audience that you can follow to find out more about each topic if you're interested. Um, and lastly, the naturalistic experiment um, community uh, is very enthusiastic about open data. And I want to highlight this beautiful, recently released public fMRI data set spearheaded by Sam Nostase. Uh, these data come from hundreds of subjects listening to hours and hours of auditory stories, and it's all free um, to download. So in the spirit of today's workshop, you can try this at home. Thanks to my wonderful lab members and to all of you for listening. And I'm looking forward to a really fantastic day of talks and tutorials. So I think there are questions sure coming up in the, Q, in the Q and A. So yeah, there's one from I think we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so we could take a question or two, right? I think there's one from Michaela and one for uh, you. In the, in the, in the, it's in the Q. They're in the Q and A. Yeah. Okay. So I, I can answer mine. Um, so from uh, Chris Pani, these are great tools. Uh, to what extent do you see the visualization tools as supporting? One, engagement and understanding with other scientists and engagement and understanding with, our, with the broader public. So the idea is really actually uh, to try to do both. 
we want to bring uh, both other scientists that are adjacent to our field, such as, for instance, like um, computer scientists, data scientists, but also from other disciplines like physics and so forth. And also, like, we want to actually uh, not only really a broader public, but also our patient populations and our clinicians to actually familiarize themselves with uh, these tools, because these things are going to be more and more pervasive as we want, we, we move forward. So it's a way to actually intuitively understand our data and our mechanisms. And uh, it would be like, uh, it would be great to jump on this as soon as possible, because that would basically um, allow us to have more people thinking about our problems and issues in mental health, both in mental health and in the behavioral disorders. And I can answer the next question here. How much variability is there in the duration of free speech epics? Given fMRI time constraints and expenses, how can we ensure that free speech is long enough but not too long? This is a great question. Um, uh, there's a lot of variability because these are um, people um, doing what comes naturally to them. I think the answer here is piloting. So if you um, pilot um, and develop your instructions and your paradigm in such a way that people know kind of what level of detail they that you are expecting and how long you want them to talk for, um, people are, are perfectly capable of generating a pretty large amount of recall. Um, I typically find that for a movie, um, you'll get the, the length of time that people spend describing the movie will be anywhere from a half to 100% of the time that they spend watching it. I'm going to go um, on to introduce our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is one of the co-organizers um, of this workshop, Manish Sagar. Um, as he's an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the um, Institute of Design at Stanford University where he works on a variety of cool topics, including the resting brain, creativity, and meditation. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Manish Sagar. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much, Yanis. Um, <clears throat> sorry for my voice. Uh, hopefully it comes back quickly. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the NIS, NIM staff, especially Michele, for this opportunity. Today, I'll showcase some of our data visualization methods um, that hopefully you can see the screen. But Okay, today I'll showcase some of the data visualization methods that we've developed in a lab in the last uh, couple of years uh, to essentially create representations for brain activity dynamics uh, during both task and resting state paradigms. So here's a broad mission statement for our lab. We want to create methods that can distill high dimensional data into simple yet vibrant and clinically relevant uh, representations that can be interactively explored to discover new aspects of the data without necessarily averaging data across space, time, or people at the outset. Um, it sounds very wordy, but the main idea is to somehow create um, an as accurate as possible or as useful as possible rather representation of data that can be uh, interacted with. Um, and the reason I say without averaging uh, data at the outset is because um, a lot of times just to increase the signal to noise ratio in our data, especially in the near imaging world, we sometimes, especially using traditional approaches, end up collapsing data either across people, creating group stats, or across time, looking at the entire scan, or across brain regions. Uh, but essentially, that kind of averaging at the outset uh, could we could miss out by doing uh, by doing this kind of approach, miss out critically critical or crucial insights that we could eventually study if it's a data driven approach where we let the data tell us where to look for. So that's our our goal: how to create such representations. And to do that, one of the tools uh, we have borrowed from the um, um, subfield of algebraic topology, it's called topological data analysis. Um, this uh, TDA has been developed here at Stanford, uh, pioneered by Gunnar Carlson, uh, one of my co-mentors for the K99, uh, where the, um, the, the main idea is to somehow learn the shape of the data. Just to give an example, if you have this 2D sample, uh, two-dimensional, sample of a bunch of points that to a human would instantly look like you look at that you're sampling from a circle or some kind of closed loop to a machine it's not as easy and the tda allows us to essentially uh, create insights about what the shape might be so here the insight is it's a loop and the, the hope is once we get some aspect uh, some understanding of the actual shape of the data in its original dimensional space and then we can uh, create much better insights about what might be happening under the hood 
So we have applied this uh, topological data analysis TDA-based approach to a bunch of neuroimaging applications. Um, in the interest of time today, I'll probably only spend uh, have enough time to spend about uh, talk about the evoked transitions during task fMRI data. But we have uh, already also looked at intrinsic or resting state activity. We are also currently looking at when during social communication when people interact with each other, like in a live hyperscanning uh, environment. How does the the um, the combined space evolve? The, uh, the mutual space uh, or the dynamical uh, landscape evolves. We're also looking at some decoding approaches uh, and Emily Finn, uh, the speaker after me, might uh, show you some results from there. Um, and obviously down the line, the plan is to apply these methods to um, examine changes in landscapes or due to interventions or due to psychiatric disorders. Uh, so we can get a better idea, um, hopefully, uh, 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 the hope is to get a um, anchor psychiatric nosology. Ultimately, eventually, the hope is to anchor the psychiatric nosology into the spatial de temporal dynamical uh, biological features. Okay, so here's a rough outline pipeline for the entire uh, method. Uh, obviously, don't have time time to take you through uh, the entire uh, pipeline, but a rough uh, goal is you take the the same case fMRI data for dimensional uh, in its entirety. So, in, in, in it's all. Um, thousands of voxel space and across time and come up with a representation that um, that it, as faithfully as possible uh, uh, represent this high dimensional data and low dimensional as a graph um, where the nodes represent whole brain activity patterns uh, that are connected if the activity is similar for some definition of similarity. And one of the highlights of TDA based approach is that it tries to using some of these filtering and uh, partial clustering steps it tries to reduce uh, the information loss, loss that usually occurs with uh, dimensional reduction. And the second uh, good thing about the TDA-based approach is that you get this graph at the end of the day rather than getting a bunch of point clouds as you might get in let's say TSNE or TC or some other approach. A graph allows you to uh, essentially apply all kinds of network science measures and it's robust, much more robust. You know? So just a quick example of how we applied this <clears throat> to fMRI data. This data was collected in Peter Benedini's lab where they essentially had this continuous multitask paradigm where one after another, a participant uh, went through task blocks like resting state for three minutes and then do a three back or two back working memory task and watch a video of a Nemo fish uh, in the aquarium looks more like resting state and then math where they just do some math operands. The reason we picked this particular data uh, is because it provides us ground truth about transitions in real in, 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 in time. So we know if, our method can pick up those transitions uh, accurately with high fidelity or not. And secondly, we have behavior for each block so we can predict uh, performance based on uh, based on the measures we extract. So, and the other thing that I may have forgotten to mention is all of these um, methods tend to create a uh, representation of the single participant level so as to avoid the uh, collapsing of data across people as well. So here's an example of four dimensional data again, with about thousand time points um, and when you pass this data through this TDA-based mapper approach, we get this kind of graph and it's a grayscale graph, but we have the meta information that every node, uh, whatever uh, brain volumes become part of that node due to similarity, we know in time what task people are doing. So we can color these nodes based on whether they're in instruction, the TRs are coming from instruction or resting state or the other task. And we get a graph like this where looks like a spider chart, but uh, it has a core and has some peripheries and turns out the peripheries are where the, uh, usually where the resting state lies. So the mind wandering and the core is where the very uh, uh, cognitive effort requiring task lies. So working memory math. And the idea behind the core is that your spatial representations across time are so similar hence they end up being very close to each other, um, especially if you're doing the task correctly. Whereas if you have this kind of a mind wandering uh, resting state, then you kind of just stumble around all over the place. So we find these code periphery structure, uh, and then we use this pie chart based visualization. So again, not averaging the information within each node, but just to represent proportionality of how many time frames are coming from which task. Um, and the cool thing is when you apply this to the single person level, you can look at obviously the, the individual differences. And here we found, I'm showing you two. Uh, participants at the uh, at the extreme ends of the two uh, the behavioral um, representation and turns out one of them is the best performer and the other one is the, is the not actually worst performer and I, I would have loved to done a done a quiz on this but um, in the interest of time doing it quickly so this guy turned out to be the best performer 
or this person, and this was the worst performer. And the, if you look um, in, on this, in this graph, uh, they have very high modularity, meaning whichever task they were, this person was doing, they're very task specific representations that uh, were um, engaged in, as opposed to this person who was probably, maybe he was just sleeping, he or she was sleeping inside the scanner. But no matter what task they did, they had a very similar spatial representation. And just taking this property of the landscape of the manifold of the graph, we can then uh, associate it with behavioral uh, 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 variables. So here's a rough demonstration of this tool um, where it's a, it's a web-based thing. So you crunch the data and then you can interact with the shape graphs or the graphs that pop out of the uh, approach. Um, so this is just one subject's data. And I will just play the movie in a second in this video. And then you will see here the spatial representation, the anatomical representation that we can get. Uh, at the single TR level. Uh, so down uh, at the bottom, there's a slider which is showing increasing numbers, which is individual TRs. And at the highlighting node, they're showing you as the person is going through different tasks, it's a resting state. So it stays in the green node area. And on the right, you can see activation deactivation in the brain uh, in real time. Um, and now the person is moving on to the memory task. So they will stay more in the core um, apart from a few excursions. Um, Okay, and uh, shout out to Caleb, my postdoc, uh, my grad student, who, uh, who, who hopefully soon become a postdoc as well, who has um, taken this version and uh, created a nice Python uh, version uh, uh, for this toolbox, called, we're calling it Dinosaur. Uh, so please check that out as well. Um, and looking forward, we, we want to go from uh, not just representing these, um, these dynamical representations, but taking them a step forward to, to try to see if we can uh, help uh, design interventions to go from, let's say, if this is so-called worst performer to best performer, um, but in, especially in clinical clinical settings, if this could be um, just making it up, but this could be somebody with a lot of rumination, and this could uh, be a person who is jumping around uh, thoughts much more fast. So it could be potentially attention deficiency, and how can we go from one to uh, the next? Um, and that's where we develop using biophysical uh, network models to do that. Um, so we're calling that tool Dynamo. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we just love these Thai uh, names. But uh, thanks to lab members, uh, postdoc Samir, uh, Yinming, Huashi, Mungsen, and then grad students Caleb and Caitlin, um, who have helped uh, with these, this whole journey. And thanks to the funding, uh, of course. And one of the tools has came out, so you can see Dinosaur, but the other two are coming soon. Um, and I have a shameless plug for the TDA workshop that's happening on July 6th. So if you're interested in this space, uh, please join us. And with that, that, hopefully I'm still in time. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Okay, so it's it's um, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Emily Finn. Uh, Emily is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Dartmouth. Uh, she completed her PhD from Yale, received a postdoctoral training from NIMH. Her current work focused on uh, understanding individual variability in brain activity and behavior, especially as it relates to the appraisal of ambiguous information under nationalistic conditions. So with that, please welcome Dr. Finn. Thanks, Manish. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Also very excited for today. Um, and actually both Janice and Manish did a really nice job of uh, setting up and giving some background for some of the stuff that I'll talk about, which is quite related uh, to what they're working on. But my title today is Individual Differences in the Appraisal of Social Information. Some of the big questions that my lab is interested in is, uh, are what makes us unique? How do our intrinsic traits bias our perceptions and judgments? And why might different people arrive at different interpretations of the same experience? Um, and so uh, in particular, we've become really interested in combining neuroimaging with naturalistic stimuli, which Dan has so nicely introduced, um, where you have people, for example, watch a movie or listen to a story in the scanner. Uh, and then we relate differences in people's ultimate interpretations of those stimuli to patterns of brain activity as they're experiencing the stimulus. Um, and because these are continuous time series data and they're very rich and high dimensional, dynamic data visualizations can really help us get a handle on what's going on. Um, and I should say that my lab is still in sort of the exploratory phase of seeing how these tools can help us, but we're seeing some very interesting findings. So I'll just give you um, a couple of snapshots of where we are applying these tools. So uh, in a first example, this was a study that we did a couple of years ago now where we um, actually created an original fictional narrative that was designed to stratify people along an axis of trait paranoia. 
So the story described an ambiguous social scenario. And the idea was that if you are someone who is more naturally paranoid, if you are higher in trait paranoia, you might get a suspicious or a nefarious read on the events going on in the story. Whereas if you're less paranoid, you might have a neutral or even a, a positive impression of the story. Um, we also had two additional conditions on the scanner, and this is all fMRI data, by the way, uh, a resting state run and a run with just an abstract visual stimulus. Um, and so these graphs here, which were uh, created in collaboration with uh, Manish Sagar, who just uh, nicely introduced his tool here, uh, these are basically low dimensional topological embeddings of whole brain activity from two individual subjects as they're undergoing uh, these different conditions. So um, the resting state run in dark purple here, and then this sort of abstract visual stimulus in blue. Uh, and then the story is split into three parts. Uh, so dark green, pink, and beige. And then um, another resting state run after the story. And uh, so again, everyone's getting the exact same perceptual input in the form of this story, but the idea is that they might be forming different impressions of this as they're listening. Uh, and so this subject on the, left, on the left here has high trait paranoia. Um, and you can see this kind of loopy structure, so to speak, in their graph, um, where certain events in the story might actually trigger some excursions out into these parts of the graph. And I can actually play uh, this movie here, hopefully. Um, and I can uh, kind of scrub through until we hit the story. So this is where the story starts. And hopefully people can see this. Um, where they are in the graph is highlighted in white on the nodes. Uh, and so they're sort of entering the story now in this first part. And then you can see they sort of uh, have this excursion out into this loop. And then they kind of come back to the middle. Uh, and then in the second part of the story, they do this even larger uh, loop out to the outside of the graph. And then finally in the um, third and final part of the story in beige, they're kind of going off into this other part of the space. Um, and then even in this subject, you can see that the two resting state runs in dark purple and orange are quite different. So their rest, um, where they are uh, in their graph is, is different before and after they listen to the story. Uh, and we can kind of uh, qualitatively, at least for the moment, contrast that with this low paranoia participant over here on the right. Uh, and you can just see uh, sort of by looking at this, that this person's graph is sort of much more clustered here. Um, actually, their biggest excursion comes during the, uh, not the story itself, but this sort of abstract visual simulation that they also underwent. Um, and if I play this visualization here uh, and just kind of scrub along for reasons of time, you can see this is now when the story is starting. They're kind of um, in this middle part. You can kind of see the, the dark green and the pink and the and the beige corresponding to the three parts of the story. But again, it's all sort of um, more clustered together. They don't seem to be having these excursions that again could be triggered by particular suspicious events that were inserted into the story. Um, so we're still working out uh, kind of the best way to quantify this and what this might mean. But I think being able to start with some exploratory data visualization like this uh, is becoming an increasingly important part of our workflow. So this is another example from a different data set. So this is a large data set of people watching a simple uh, geometric shape animation. So these are sort of a classic stimulus in psychology, uh, often referred to as the hydrosimal animations. And basically the task here is just to decide if these, I'll play this movie in a second. This is the actual stimulus that people saw, but the task they were given was a simple one. And it was just to decide if the shapes were having a social interaction or were simply moving randomly. Uh, and so this particular stimulus was intended to be perceived as random motion by the experimenters, but it turned out that it did actually evoke the perception of a social interaction in a substantial number of people. So what I'm about to play again is the actual stimulus that people saw, uh, and then another um, version of a low dimensional embedding of whole brain activity and how the trajectory differs between people that ultimately perceive this as social uh, versus random versus not sure. So these are averaged across multiple individuals and this was a visualization created with uh, Dr. Jeremy Manning's lab's uh, HyperTools package, which you'll hear more about from him in a second. So let me go ahead and play this. And you can kind of see that all three groups start in a similar place. And then the people that ultimately end up reporting a social interaction kind of quickly diverge off into uh, a different part of the space, whereas the people that perceive this as random versus say that they're not sure kind of stick together for longer and then ultimately maybe um, kind of diverge a little bit and then maybe start to come back together towards the end. Um, and so uh, this is, I think, again, just a really interesting way um, to get a handle on how uh, in real time different people are arriving at different interpretations of this. And we can um, do lots of things where we try to map this back onto brain activity and things like that, um, which I won't show you for reasons of time, uh, but Jeremy will, will talk more about this tool as well.
Um, in the interest of time, I think I may actually skip this. Uh, I'll just move through this really, really quickly. So this was another example where we had people watch longer live action films. Uh, this is not real time now. Uh, the movie's too long to play this, but these are different individuals' trajectories as they watch this film with social content. And each line is a participant, and they're colored by uh, basically this trait um, social function score. You can also think of it as sort of how lonely they tend to be. Um, and, you know, these are... Um, there's a lot going on here and uh, we're still kind of piecing through this, but it does seem in certain parts in the movie, like maybe the people that are more lonely, uh, there may be more variability in those individuals. And again, I'm still sort of piecing through and quantifying that. Another example here whoops, um, comes from a non-social movie. So this was a movie of a Rube Goldberg machine here. Uh, there's just one human there at the start, but then it's sort of this mechanical trajectory rather than a social trajectory. And here the participants are colored by how engaging they ultimately found this movie. So this was initially intended as our control stimulus. It turned out people really liked watching this, most people. So they rated it uh, very engaging in red. And then there was one person that didn't really like it <laughs> and they rated it as less engaging in blue. Um, and here's a, a 2D um, visualization of that. So uh, the subject in blue, you can sort of maybe loosely start to interpret this as um, a sort of mind wandering. They're less engaged in the stimulus per their ultimate report. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge my lab here at Dartmouth and my funding uh, and the collaborators that have built these awesome tools that you can see here. And uh, just to keep us on time, I'm not sure there's questions, but let's move on to Dr. Jeremy Manning. So it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague here at Dartmouth, Dr. Jeremy Manning, who is an assistant professor in our Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. Uh, he has dual BSs in computer science and neuroscience from Brandeis University a PhD in neuroscience from University of Pennsylvania, and he did his postdoc training at Princeton. Here at Dartmouth, he directs the Contextual Dynamics Lab, which uses computational models, behavioral experiments, and brain recordings to track and also manipulate the ever-changing thoughts that are, we carry into each new moment. Um, and in the course of doing this really innovative research, his lab is also developing um, some awesome tools that I've already uh, previewed for you that they share with the world. Uh, so with that, um, take it away, Jeremy. My name is Jeremy Manning, and I'm an assistant professor of psychological and brain sciences at Dartmouth College. I also direct the contextual dynamics lab there. I'm going to be using some of the key questions my lab studies as examples to illustrate some ways that we have used dynamic data visualizations in our own projects, and to hopefully spark some ideas about how you might use these sorts of approaches in your own work. My lab studies the underpinnings of human thought. A lot of how we study and think about thoughts ends up being about the brain network dynamics that support learning and memory and communication and other high level mental operations. One tool we use to help quantify thoughts is geometric spaces called thought spaces like the one I'm showing here. Each coordinate in this space is like one thought or set of thoughts that you might potentially have. And the geometry of the space is set up so that conceptually related thoughts live nearby. So duck and goose are assigned to nearby coordinates in this space, whereas duck and truck live further apart. We define these spaces using text embedding models that are typically fit to huge text corpora. Because these spaces are often visually complicated, it's often helpful to visualize them dynamically. In this slide, I'm showing low dimensional embeddings of the text of roughly 7,500 research articles. Each article appears as a dot, and when we color the articles by subject area, we can see from how dots of the same color tend to clump together that this approach is capturing the notion that articles about similar things are embedded into this space at nearby locations. When we rotate this static image, we can really start to get a sense of the full three-dimensional structure. You can start to see that there's quite a bit of structure to the set of embedded coordinates. For example, if you think about a bounding box tightly enclosing the set of coordinates for these articles, that bounding box would represent the space of possible locations that articles could be embedded into. But in practice, articles almost always live on this complicated looking surface that emerges visually when we rotate this cloud of points. You could even imagine creating a document classifier that uses the distance from this surface within this space 
as a heuristic for estimating whether a particular held out document is a member of this collection or not. If we're careful about how we define these spaces, we can also always follow the mapping from an arbitrary embedded location back to the original conceptual meanings of each coordinate. Sometimes those meanings are best described by individual words, like the dots shown in this particular example. But when a particular location falls between individual words coordinates, it's often more accurate to think of locations in these spaces as word clouds that reflect weighted blends of thoughts about many atomic concepts. When our thoughts change over time, we can characterize those dynamics using thought trajectories. The shapes of those trajectories can help us test detailed theories about cognition using the tools of the field of geometry. Here are some real thought trajectories from people who are listening to a 10-minute story. Each color represents a different person. And just by looking at this animation, you can start to get a sense of what's happening in people's thoughts. For example, you can see that there are certain points in the story where everyone's thought trajectories kind of deflect at the same moment. Maybe those are like high-level plot changes in a story. And you can also see that even though these people all have similar thoughts, they're not identical. So we can start to ask about how spread out different people's thoughts are at different points in the story, or about why one particular person's thoughts diverge from the group at a particular moment. Even though the full trajectory would look overwhelming if I showed the full thing in a static plot, visualizing the trajectories dynamically can be a really compelling way to focus attention on just one small part of the data set in each frame. It helps us illustrate the structure of the data set in a digestible and intuitive way. Of course, it's not strictly necessary to visualize these trajectories dynamically. Here are two examples of trajectories that we can get a good sense of even in static form, since there aren't many places where the trajectories intersect themselves. The thought trajectory on the left shows how the conceptual content of a television episode unfolds over time. And then the thought trajectory on the right shows the thought trajectories derived from people as they were trying to remember what had happened in the episode. Even without a formal statistical test, you can see that the shapes look really visually similar, which means that there's some correspondence between the episode people watched and how people are thinking about the episode when they remember it later. In other words, our memory systems are picking up on something about the global structure of the episode's trajectory in a way that enables us to reconstruct it later. We can also look for subtle distortions or disagreements between these shapes to help us understand when our memories are inaccurate or incomplete. The trajectories I'm visualizing here come from a fantastic public data set collected by one of my fellow workshop organizers, Janice Chen. Her Sherlock data set is a wonderful example of how data sharing, particularly of really clever and rich experimental data sets, can give a project an extended life beyond its original intended scope. Janice's Sherlock dataset has remained one of my favorites, but we're lucky as scientists today to have access to many thousands of public datasets that are just begging to be analyzed and visualized in new ways. Another point that visualizing thought trajectories highlights is the need to consider the full scope and structure of our experiences beyond individual moments in isolation. If we think that our memory systems are picking up on the global structure of our experiences, then in order to understand the dynamics and underpinnings of our thoughts, we need to consider how each moment and how we think about that moment relates to the rest of our experiences. There's also a growing body of evidence that different brain regions are sensitive to the statistical structure of our experiences at different timescales and levels of conceptual detail. For example, sensory regions seem to respond to low-level perceptual aspects of our experiences that unfold over short timescales, and as you move to higher order cortex, you see brain regions that seem to respond to higher level conceptual aspects of our experiences that often unfold over much longer timescales. If we want to understand how our brains support our thoughts, then we also need to think about how the representations maintained by different brain areas interact and influence each other. That means that a key aspect of studying the neural basis of thought is about modeling and characterizing patterns of brain network dynamics under different cognitive circumstances. Network dynamics are another key area 
that is ripe for dynamic data visualization approaches. So to make this movie, I've applied a model to estimate a set of nodes throughout the brain, which are shown here as gray spheres. And then in each frame, I'm showing a red line when the associated region's responses are positively correlated, and a blue line when the region's responses are negatively correlated. From the animation, even without knowing what's happening in this experiment and without doing any formal statistical test, you can see this lightning storm of correlated activity that appears periodically. And the animation lets us intuit what's going on, which can then lead us to define and formally test specific hypotheses. These examples using thought spaces and brain network dynamics are part of a broader question space my lab is tackling related to how different people transmit information to each other and how we verbally describe our past experiences to ourselves and to other people. Essentially, we're building models of individual people's thought spaces, and we're trying to use the geometric alignment between those spaces across people to describe how efficiently those people might be able to communicate with each other. We're looking at scenarios like teachers communicating with students or doctor-patient interactions and other things like that. If you're interested in any of these ideas, or if you'd like to learn more, I hope you'll check out my lab website where you'll find links to our papers, code, and data. Thanks so much for participating in this workshop, and I'm looking forward to more dynamic data visualization discussions with you throughout the day. Um, for our next speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Tim Behrens, who will be giving our first keynote lecture today. Um, Dr. Behrens has been at Oxford since he uh, carried out his doctoral training there and then stayed on as a postdoctoral researcher and then a lecturer, and now as a professor of computational neuroscience. Um, and he also holds an honorary position at University College London. Um, he's led uh, groundbreaking research in uh, functional neuroimaging, brain connectivity, neuroanatomy, learning, decision-making, and reward, and more. And he's also won many awards for his work, including the UK Life Sciences Blavatnik Award for Young Scientists, and he's also a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, and he also holds leadership positions at um, PLOS Computational Biology, PLOS Biology, and eLife. And today, he's going to be speaking to us from the perspective of his role as deputy editor at eLife, where he's working on new approaches for evaluating and communicating scientific research. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Tim Behrens. Uh, yeah, thanks very much uh, for the uh, ridiculous sounding introduction, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, very grateful. Um, and, um, uh, I'm going to share my screen. So, I, so um, you can forget all the neuroscience I do today. I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist today. I'm an editor and talking to you about stuff that's happening at eLife. Um, so let me just share the, uh, actually, I'm just going to play it in. I've got to do this weird thing of play in window before play in window and then, and then share it. Uh, so um, I've been like massively impressed with all these amazing new ways of visualizing data that people are coming up with. Uh, can you see my, my, what are you looking at? Are you looking at a, at a presentation here? Yeah, Tim, that... I can see a presentation. Yeah, yeah perfect. So uh, yeah, I've been massively impressed by um, uh, these amazing new data visualization um, so that have come out of all the talks so far and it's a great thing to be thinking about. Uh, but the big problem is that um, when you come to share all this work, you'll be sharing it in PDF, um, uh, which is going to be uh, tough to get that, make those amazing visualizations. And so uh, I'm here today to tell you uh, what eLife are trying to do to solve that problem. Um, uh, uh, but first, um, since everybody sort of starts off um, explaining what their lab does uh, at the start of these kinds of talks, I'm just going to spend two or three minutes explaining what eLife is. Um, so eLife is a journal uh, that is trying that publishes really high quality science. Um, that's uh, most of what we do. Um, and we make a lot of, uh, all the decisions made by scientists, and we try to publish rigorous high quality science openly. Um, but it's also um, a uh, research uh, hub for how we should do publishing. 
Uh, lots of people at Eli think the publishing doesn't work very well. Um, and so we need, uh, we try to innovate. Part of our mission is to innovate how, both how we run the business of publishing and uh, how we um, uh, communicate our results. Um, and we're funded to do that. Um, in fact, we're not really funded to, to run a journal anymore. We were originally also funded to run a journal, but mostly the journal is now self-running in terms of finances. And almost all of our funding goes towards innovating um, and understanding what the community needs. Um, and so uh, we innovate in, two or th in, in several different spheres. I'll just tell you about a couple of them uh, quickly. Um, yeah, so... Um, so uh, we innovate in historically in how in how science publishing works, and so we put a lot of, a lot of effort into increasing transparency in, in peer review, into making new ways of peer review working, consultative review, which leads to quick and clear decisions for authors and, and reduces the time in revision. Um, I mean, many of you may have experienced that uh, working with eLife. Um, we we. Uh, are a big promoter of, uh, of open uh, science, so uh, everything we do is open access, um, and we're, uh, uh, we, were, we were a big early adopter of broad open science publishing. So that's, that's uh, a lot of historical things that eLife are doing, and eLife are now going um, a lot further uh, in, the, in this direction, and so uh, we're, we're implementing a new model which instead of uh, which goes, which effectively says, instead of um, review reviewing a paper before publishing it, uh, we're going to take advantage of of what's happening in the preprint world, where every where papers are basically all published uh, before they're even submitted to journals, and we're going to try to work out how it's possible to run a completely different way of publishing, where you publish before reviewing, and then you curate that. Um, that published uh, literature. And so here's a kind of example of the kinds of things we're doing now. We're putting a lot of energy, we're taking preprint seriously, trying to get rid of gatekeeping and putting a lot of energy into curating uh, the preprint space. And so we're trying to uh, publish concise takes on preprints along with detailed reviews to try to help people understand the contributions of, of uh, preprints. Um, and uh, right now, um, obviously, uh, we're still a journal that publishes, uh, make, makes gatekeeping publishing decisions, uh, but we're, we're trying to push the sphere towards making a world in which everybody uh, doesn't need uh, gatekeeping journals anymore. And so we're trying to uh, do those innovations. And that's where a lot of our editorial practice is happening right now. Um, I'm just going to uh, 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 just change to my first demo. This is the only demo that isn't about visualization. Um, but this is a, a demo showing how why it can be useful. Uh, here's a um, uh, eLife also makes infrastructure for other um, uh, for other uh, people, and it shares that infrastructure uh, broadly. Uh, so here's um, here's this thing, Society, that we're making, which is going to end up being a broad tool uh, for curating uh, the literature. This is a paper that ended up being published in June um, about. Um, uh, about uh, SARS-CoV, uh, about COVID. Um, uh, so it was published on June 21st in Nature. Uh, and this is our website, Society, uh, curating uh, uh, opinions from, from um, lots of uh, authoritative people, uh, uh, groups uh, who, who are reviewing uh, uh, the uh, preprint literature. And you can see uh, opinions and clear, um, clear opinions were, were present uh, in April, a long time before the paper was published, even though uh, it was under Nature's rapid publishing. And so uh, that's a major thing that's happening at eLife right now. It is not to do with data visualization, but I just thought I was allowed three minutes to tell you that. Um, <clears throat> let's go back to the presentation, um, and uh, which is uh, here. So we don't just innovate in how, or try to innovate in how the mechanisms of publishing works. We, we also are um, funded to innovate in how science is communicated, communicated. So much in the spirit of today's talks, uh, we can lose the legacy of print publishing. Uh, we can uh, try to make new ways of sharing our data, our, our, our work, uh, which uh, can communicate the science in the clearest and most transparent way that current technology allows. 
And critically, not only do we do that for ourselves, but we also try to write open source software that makes it easy for other journals to borrow uh, this approach. And so we're trying to change ha this, how science publishing uh, works uh, broadly, not just within Eli. And I'm going to show you two examples of that in the space of data visualization, um, uh, which I think uh, would be useful to many of the people who have presented already today. Uh, so the first is uh, um, quite a simple but nevertheless impactful thing, which is uh, which is making um, uh, articles that can embed more richer media than just figures. I'm going to show you an example of a video, but you can imagine audio, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, being being inside uh, figures. And then uh, the most exciting thing I think um, is uh, um, uh, uh, these executable research articles, which I think would allow you. Um, to uh, to publish most of the figures that were in uh, Michele's talk at the start. Okay, so um, uh, let's start there. We'll start with um, embedding videos and papers. And again, I'm just going to flip. I'm sorry for all this flipping, but I thought it was better, given that these that we're a publisher, uh, to show you uh, actual papers that we've published. And so I'm going to flip out. And I'm going to go find an eLife paper. <clears throat> uh, so here's here's an eLife. Uh, let me share. There's my Sati window. Here's an eLife paper. This is an eLife paper about some monkeys that are grasping, reaching and grasping uh, some objects. And the critical thing is how do they grasp them? And how does the brain control how they grasp them? And if you were writing a traditional paper, you would spend a long time explaining this task. And probably that your reader wouldn't really understand what you're talking about. But if you have the opportunity to put a video, embed a video, inside your paper, uh, then you can do something like this. This is just literally showing the monkey doing the task. So in some senses, you can lose a whole section of the paper, which just is describing in long-winded terms how the task is set up. Just you see that and you know what the whole paper is about. Uh, and then here's this, the video. Uh, this, this one I really like as well underneath it. So now the question is, um, OK, well, how did the musculature um, uh, enact that? So there's EMGs everywhere. Uh, and you can see as the different grasps are happening, uh, you can see the EMGs um, uh, or in fact, uh, uh, this one actually isn't. This is the uh, angles of all the joints, but, but uh, below is the uh, EMGs. This is the angles of all the joints. And you can imagine it's just so much easier to align the, with this video, it's so much easier to see what's going on. Here's about to grasp a cylinder. You can see, yeah. So that, um, uh, that pretty, um, that pretty simple uh, step of allowing, uh, of f forgetting the PDF and allowing authors to embed um, um, more complicated media inside, uh, in, inside a web article already I think gives a lot of power uh, for people to um, uh, play uh, interesting games uh, with their articles. And it's always fun to see uh, what people are doing. Um, uh, I'm gonna stop this show and go back to the presentation, flip flop back again. Um, uh, and uh, so here's uh, the second example. And this second example is a much bigger beast than that. This is called an executable research article. Um, and uh, effectively, we're allowing you to publish your data and your code. And I'll show you, I'll show you how that works. Um, so uh, this is the basic premise that we've all been discussing already today. So traditional research manuscripts still still are useless in terms of in terms of um, uh, what modern technology could do in terms of sharing communicating science um, and um, it, one thing that hasn't been said I, I, I suppose so this the, many of these points have been discussed already so I won't belabor them but one thing that has has not been discussed is that um, it's possible to hide an awful lot in a figure right you can uh, play with the thresholds and present the best ones etc cetera, etc cetera. and we and or and we all know people do it. Uh, and so uh, pub if you can make a richer um, uh, uh, explication of, the, of your data, uh, a more uh, interactive explication of your data, 
then it's going to be um, it's going to be a more auditable, more reproducible um, uh, 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 article, a more reproducible. Um, it's going to favour more reproducible sciences because people can really dig around and see what's in the data. So that's a real incentive for us to be, to be doing this as well. Um, so uh, yeah, so we want to make articles which are themselves executable, that have code embedded in them, that you can execute that code, change that code. Um, so it's, these articles are going to encapsulate usable code and data within the flow of a manuscript, um, deliver progressive enhancement from, from, so from a static research article to data, to, to full data and code interaction. And I'll show you in a minute how far we are along that progression. Critically, we want, we'll make them future proof. So just because the, um, uh, like the, the coding languages might move to a new version or that kind of stuff, that isn't gonna, uh, it's important that that shouldn't um, make the uh, articles that we publish defunct. Um, and we want to be able to make, to, to do this stuff in a way that uh, anybody who knows basic coding uh, can, can um, make use of it. Uh, and we think that, that if we can do something like that, uh, articles that really embed, embed uh, data and code, uh, it'll make um, for much more uh, transparent um, and trustworthy science. And I'll show you um, where, where we are with that uh, now. Um, here, here is a paper that we published in eLife. What this paper is, is a meta-analysis of, it's a, you don't actually need to know what it's a meta-analysis of. It's a meta-analysis that we published in eLife. Um, and you can see this is what it looks like uh, in its uh, traditional form. Here's a nice figure. And it is, it's very beautiful, uh, but they're flat figures, right? Uh, here's another one uh, down here. This one really is a complicated beast. And you'd be uh, terrified of this figure if you uh, um, wanted to, if you um, uh, saw this in a flat, in a, in a normal picture. This is describing all the different um, uh, papers that have gone into this meta-analysis in some detail, in the kind of detail that you might tell your graduate student you could never possibly share with, with, with the world. So just make some summary graphs for me. Uh, excellent. So if I, it, so you can go to this, this article and then you can just press this thing up here which says, see this research in executable code view. Um, and so I'm going to press that online and I'm going to pray that it works. Here it is. It's working. Look, there's this really fun thing at the top saying run document because you're running it. It's a program now, right? <clears throat> so that's cool. Uh, here's that figure again that I just showed you. Can you see what's happening now? So it's now interactive. It tells me if I look at the excluded articles, it tells me uh, which uh, what the what the uh, criteria were for exclusion. When I hover over there, um, it, 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 it labels are appearing online. This is an article that's published online at eLife, right? So um, that's cool. Uh, here's, uh, uh, here you can go and have a look at every single study, how many, how many um, patients they had. And this is, this is containing an enormous amount more information uh, than the flat uh, article did. Because you can, because as everyone says, you can focus your attention on one piece at, at the same time and build up sequentially your understanding of the graph in a way that you can't in a single flat paper page. And here's that horrible figure that, that everybody hated, that the supervisor wouldn't even let the um, uh, student uh, present. But now you can go in there and zoom just before, and now it turns into a really useful thing. It's something that you can flick around and say, okay, I can interact with it hierarchically. I wanna see all the MTR ones. Okay, here's one down here. Uh, it tells me this, this one's got a low R squared, and it tells me the, sample, the, the number of samples, et cetera, et cetera. You can imagine how this is a much more useful thing uh, than you could do in a flat. Okay, uh, again, again, again. And then this is kind of fun, right? So uh, here, I'm just gonna show you uh, um, this, this fun feature. So uh, all of these figures, and it's not just figures by the way, but I'm just gonna show you figures. All these figures, uh, you can click on this little eye up here and you can see the code that runs them. And you could go down and you can change it. And you can see what happens if I change the threshold or change this, that, or the other. Or in this case, if I change this subplot title uh, to uh, NI, NIMH data viz workshop. Now let's see if this works. Now I can I could run the, I could run the whole document again, or I could just maybe even run this figure. If I just run this figure, requesting a session. Session starting, is it gonna work? <laughs> right, let's, let, let's have a look at what the figure looks like now. Oh no, no output. Let's run the document instead. 
Oh, look at that. This figure is now titled NIMH DataViz Workshop. So you can go in there and you can play with the data, you can edit it, see what it does to the graphs, uh, play with the code. This is an executable uh, research article. Um, cool. Uh, and then if you want to uh, just go back and share that, share the article uh, by emailing it or something like that, you can uh, return to the original article and you've got a, a normal uh, article which you can get a PDF of or something like that. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that demonstration uh, was it's always difficult to know when people can't, what people have understood or not on Zoom. Uh, but let me go back to my presentation. Uh, cool. Um, so uh, to, to make one of these uh, ERAs, um, you uh, it's easy, right? Uh, well, the, the hardest bit uh, is getting published in eLife. Uh, that's the first thing you have to do. So you don't worry about the ERA. I mean, obviously, it's great if you can be thinking about it from the time when you're designing your paper. But actually, uh, before you, uh, before you uh, uh, start the ERA process, you need to have an eLife paper. Um, and then... Um, uh, you go to uh, Sten you go to um, Stencilla, who are uh, collaborators that are building this with eLife, um, and you can um, uh, you can uh, automatically convert your eLife article, which will be an eLife format, and convert it with a um, uh, with a tool into R Markdown or Jupyter Notebook. Um, and then you can uh, add code. So if you're coding in R or Jupyter, you can just add codes, uh, or R or Python, you can just add code from your, from your, from your R Markdown or your Jupyter Notebook uh, locally, and then you can upload that enriched code, um, and uh, then you can, and, um, and that's going to make your um, ERA, your executable uh, research article, and actually right now, the eLife team will then work with you uh, to optimize it and make it look cool uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, we think this is scalable um, and we think that uh, other people will be able to use it. So um, uh, the team have tried to make uh, sure uh, that it's, um, uh, a, 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 uh, it, it operates well with, uh, with uh, um, lots of authoring and conversion tools. It um, uh, re is reliable um, and um, it's, um, uh, won't, it's minimally disruptive to, from the publisher side. So what that means is other journals will be able to just take it because, because it starts the process after you've got a, after they've accepted your paper, they do whatever they do. And then, and then um, uh, the ERA process starts then. And so we hope it'll be really easy for other journals to borrow this. Um, it's open source uh, and modular, and so we hope it'll be easy for people to contribute to it, to make it, uh, to, um, to, to make it, we give it new functionality, um, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And as I say, this has all been developed uh, together uh, with Sensilla. Uh, there's one more thing I wanted to maybe show you, which is, uh, let me just move out of, there are a bunch of things that uh, we have for more inf information. I'll show you them quickly on the web, and then these websites are, here, uh, so um, uh, uh, the so uh, we have um, a uh, we published on our lab's web website. We published um, a, a paper uh, by Emmy Sang and, and Julia uh, Machigurchi, uh, um, uh explaining how you go about getting an eLife thing, and um, and with a button saying, "I want to turn my eLife paper into an ERA." Um, uh, and a whole bunch of frequently asked questions, so that you can um, uh, you can figure out what, uh, how how to go about it. There is a webinar explaining how you go about it as well. Um, there is um, uh, Stencilla have detailed instructions on how to uh, do it. So hopefully we've helped. It'll be easy for people who want to do it. Uh, these are uh, some of the ones we've done so far. So we've already published. Uh, 15, 20 or so um, uh, executable uh, research articles. Um, and these are the ones that are in progress that people are working on right now. And so you can see we've got a few more coming. And including some neuro ones. Um, yeah. That I am really just the face of eLife today. I haven't done any of this work. Um, uh, and uh, the work's been done by, uh, by the um, product and innovation team 
um, and uh, Julia Gazzardi from that team is, is here as well, and so we'll be able to um, uh, uh, answer or help me answer any questions that you have. Uh, thanks very much indeed. I think, I think I'm probably uh, getting towards the end of my time. Tim, there are a few questions in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so I love this idea, much better than print. How would this type of publication be catalogued? How would you find a lit review? So, so, and um, exactly the same way that 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 we're cataloging right now. I mean, it's got it's going to have a DOI. It will be indexed in PubMed. It's just an eLife paper. In fact, there's a version of this eLife paper that's just a PDF. Uh, but um, uh, but then it also comes along with this um, uh, enriched executable uh, version, which is presumably much much clearer. So I don't think there's any problem in term, terms of PubMed indexing or uh, um, or um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, so next, uh, well done, this is the right direction. Thanks very much, we think so. Um, uh, for ERAs, there must be access to the full data set, correct? Where are those data stored? Well, um, so how much of your data do you need to upload? Um, so in the cases that you, so I mean, uh, I mean, I. Maybe Julia, did you want Julia? Do you want to answer that question? Yeah, sure. that uh, hi everyone. By the way, I'm Julia Wizzardi, an innovation officer at eLife, and yeah, I'm a little bit here as a like technology expert behind uh, behind the executable research articles. Um, for now, like uh, data sets are usually stored in the repository uh, in uh, GitHub. So usually, we can actually upload those repository and retrieve them. Uh, from uh, GitHub to um, the basically the Sensila hub, that it's like another uh, middle ground where the executable research article gets actually uh, translated into its new form. So uh, that's where like I, like the magic happens basically. So the data are now retrieved retrieved from that, but uh, now eLife has also uh, a new integration uh, with Riot. Uh, on the on the website, so uh, data could be stored also in Dryad. In that case, uh, cool. Um, uh, Janine Simmons. So uh, you guys should stop me when when I when we've taken our time because because um, there seems to be a few questions. Um, uh, you can take another one, and maybe like the rest, you can answer like uh, like yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, so the answer for us is yeah. So ERAs are are are, are like Jupiter. Yeah, in fact, it's Python code. It's like Jupiter or R Markdown. That's that's the simple answer to to, to the Forrest question, uh, Forrest Schuster's question. It's um, that's the way it's working. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, uh, I think it would be interesting to to answer maybe uh, Theodora's question live. Um, um, Oh no, okay, I, I read it wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I was asking about the editor position, not uh, yeah, Theodora, to Theodora, you can, um, an article. Theodora, you can email me separately about that, 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 that question. Uh, oh, Richard's question's interesting. Um, uh, uh, are the innovation team working on anything like that, Julia? So, I mean, obviously we have ways of just sharing the data and code. But uh, so uh, Rich is quite, um, Rich, uh, Rich is saying, are there um, interesting new ideas about how to share all of the data in, a, in, an, in, an, in an interactive and interesting uh, way um, uh, that can be peer reviewed? I, so I don't think we are, well, Julia, maybe you can comment on whether the team are thinking beyond ERAs about how to share uh, uh, the, the bulk of the data. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, as far as I know, like the direction we're going uh, uh, is like to integrate as much uh, uh, libraries or as much uh, data type as possible. So the mm -hmm. direction right now, obviously, is uh, we're actually before trying to uh, translate into eras those articles that have already been published by Life. So for now, like those were the only languages then were only the type, those type of data that uh, uh, we were challenged into translating into eras. But uh, um, as far as I know, uh, the team is now working in uh, introducing into an era a model in 3D of the brain. 
So uh, we're going a lot farther with the type of data yeah. and the type of visualization. Uh, we're going to introduce it. We're going to introduce yeah. like, That was kind of what I was, I, I was hoping you'd say. So, so, I mean, at the moment it's noticeable that the ERA things that you can mostly do are plots, interactive plots, not that don't have the data and where the analysis has already been done. And this is how we yeah. present it. Um, but but it seems to me that it's even more interesting if you can if you can uh, do some of the data analysis online inside the inside the article. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now everything is accessible. So if you go on the Sansila Hub, everything is published there. You can download it. You can read like the code and play with it, uh, or like uh, uh, add chunks uh, and use those code that were used in the e life paper. So everything is uh, completely uh, accessible. So. Yeah. I think maybe we've had our time now. So th uh, thanks for inviting us and thanks, Julia, for saving me. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I think we can answer in the chat for the others in, re in written yeah. format. So, yeah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. This was uh, outstanding. I really loved it. Thank you. Thank you both. Excellent. Uh, thank you to Tim and Julia. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, who is Dr. Aaron Alexander Block. Dr. Alexander Block received a bachelor's degree in philosophy from Harvard, a PhD in computational biology from the University of Cambridge, and an MD from UCLA. Uh, he did psychiatry residency at Yale before moving to Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania at UPenn, where he's an attending psychiatrist and also directs the Brain Gene Development Lab. Uh, he's won several awards, including the NIMH Outstanding Resident Award. Uh, and broadly, his research investigates both normal brain development and the altered developmental trajectories that lead to mental illness. Uh, and most recently, he and his team have been working to integrate big data uh, from publicly available imaging and genomics resources, like, for example, UK Biobank, with deep phenotyping of individuals that they have in the UPenn system, um, with the ultimate goal of translating polygenic risk scores for psychosis and other neuro neurodevelopmental psychiatric disorders into pathophysiologic mechanisms that can inform therapeutic targets and improve risk assessment. Uh, so please join me in welp welcoming Dr. Alexander Block. Thanks very much, Emily. Um, and thanks very much for this opportunity to speak to all of you. In particular, I want to thank Nutella and Josh for the vision that the, these topics are really important for NIMH. Um, I am a practicing psychiatrist uh, and also an assistant professor at Penn where I lead a multidisciplinary research group focused on psychiatric neuroimaging. And today I'm presenting a project that we've been working on in our lab along with many collaborators to characterize brain growth charts from MRI morphology across the lifespan. Part and parcel of the scientific goals of this project is the development of a usable online platform where the data and models can be explored interactively and also applied to new data sets by other researchers. So my two overarching goals are to both describe the science of this project, but also to showcase uh, this platform itself. With that in mind, there are four parts to this talk, each of which includes a demonstration of the online resource. So first, I'm going to introduce why we think brain charts are important and the data we used to create our preliminary models. Second, I'm going to show how we use brain charts to describe new, or new, new neuroimaging based developmental milestones. Third, I'll show how we use brain charts to characterize clinical alterations in patient groups. And finally, I'm going to discuss how brain charts can be used in tandem with novel data and also where we want to take this work in the future. So first, the why and how of brain charts. Growth charts in some form have been around since the late 18th century. The first known growth chart was developed for height. And since then, this simple way to quantify age-related changes against a reference standard has been a cornerstone of pediatric care and also research in many disciplines. Growth charts remain a powerful example of personalized or precision medicine, but widely used growth charts exist mainly for a small set of anthropometric variables, such as height, weight, and head circumference. The lack of a brain reference standard is particularly relevant for psychiatric disorders, which are generally accepted to be disorders of brain development. So this classic graphic shows hypothesized alterations at the brain's cellular level in people with psychosis risk, and how these cellular changes may map onto structural neuroimaging findings during typical development. Despite many advances in our understanding of psychiatric illness and its brain correlates, 
It's also true that we in psychiatric neuroimaging have yet to provide breakthroughs with clinical impact on par with other areas of medical science. And one contributing factor for this may be the continued difficulty in establishing reference standards to anchor findings of age-related changes. Many important discoveries have yielded a general understanding of how the brain grows in typical development, some of which is summarized in this figure from an excellent recent review. There's too great a body of work to do it justice in such a short talk. Our challenge remains though, to continue to work towards practically useful neuroimaging growth charts. This is partly due to difficulties in data harmonization across studies, studies that often target disjointed developmental periods and separate clinical conditions. A big part of this challenge is also that, in contrast with standard pediatric growth charts, such as those for height and weight, MRI is more sensitive to technological variation in things like scanner platforms, acquisition, and analytic strategy, which is one of the reasons why the period from fetal growth through early postnatal development through the preschool years is rarely incorporated into multi-site studies, even those that have a lifespan focus, despite evidence that early processes shape growth trajectories and vulnerability to psychiatric conditions. Another important point is that brain growth and maturation continues through adulthood well beyond the developmental period covered by anthropometric charts. So rather than charts of brain growth per se, what we really want is charts of age-related changes across the whole lifespan. Notwithstanding all these hurdles, the building blocks are in place to create brain charts for the human lifespan. And that's thanks to the investment from NIH and other funding bodies in large scale imaging data sets and the support for collaborative multi-site initiatives and also recent advances in image processing and statistical frameworks for data harmonization. So I'm going to present some of our work in this area, which is extremely recent. It hasn't yet been peer reviewed, but is available on BioArchive. And as you can see, this is a true team science approach using data from multiple consortia, as well as data shared directly for this project. In particular, I wanna stress the work by the equal contribution first authors on this paper, Jacob Seedlitz, who's a postdoc in my lab and our international collaborators at the University of Cambridge, Richard Bethlehem and Simon White, who work closely with Professor Ed Bullmore in the Cambridge Psychiatry Department. As I mentioned before, and I think in keeping with the goals of this workshop, we really see the development of a usable resource as a major part of this effort. And I'll walk through the current version of this research, which is online at brainchart.io, built using Shiny in the R environment. And I do encourage people to explore this yourselves, although maybe not while I'm talking as a server may not yet be ready to withstand quite that level of curiosity. Um, and this is a quick illustration of the data that went into these models on the back end. We incorporated over 95 studies, including over 100,000 individual brain MRI scans from the prenatal period through to the very end of life. To our knowledge, this is the largest MRI data set to date and the most comprehensive in terms of age range across the lifespan. Every participant here contributed structural MRI data. They also have what we call biological covariates like age and biological sex, as well as what we call technical variates, which encompass information about the MRI platform and image processing pipeline. It's important to note that so far we focused on global volume phenotypes, total cerebral gray matter illustrated here in purple, subcortical gray matter here in yellow, white matter volume in blue, and ventricular cerebrospinal fluid volume in orange. And the focus on these global phenotypes is both a weakness, but also a strength of the study. It's a weakness because of course, we're interested like everybody else in more complex phenotypes like folding and cortical expansion at the millimeter scale not even to mention things like fMRI and diffusion MRI. But this focus is also a strength because technical artifacts are less profound for the global volume features, which makes them an ideal test case for this framework. And the data sets that went into our models can be explored using the interactive resource. So if we accept all the disclaimers, getting us into the main site, we go to data selection, we can look at just subsets of studies or even a single study, or you can stick with the whole data set. We can also just look at specific processing pipelines or include all of them, which is the default. And we can also look at the data geographically. So if we go into the map of studies tab to look at the sample size geographically and the color scale here is in terms of thousands of subjects. 
it won't be surprising to people in the field that the single largest study is the UK Biobank. And if we click on a study, we get some basic information about the study, including data access requirements, when the study site has made that information available. So that's the sort of basic motivation and the data behind these models. And now I'll talk about our work using brain charts to characterize neuroimaging developmental milestones. Briefly, the statistical approach that we use is called GAM-LSS, which is a robust and flexible approach to model nonlinear growth trajectories, which is recommended by the World Health Organization and implemented in R. To show the general approach, here we're looking at some public data on head circumference. And using this data as a reference, we can derive these colored centile lines in terms of age and sex specific distributions. So now we can take a new individual's raw head circumference data from this population and reinterpret it as a percentile, or sometimes we just say centile, against the reference data. And our goal is to do something analogous, but for our more complex data, the global volume phenotypes from anatomical MRI. And we want to do this while accounting for technical covariates that are potentially so problematic. It's a good sign that even prior to any modeling, the imaging features across studies show clear age-related trends. But there was also a lot of heterogeneity between studies, which are shown in different colors in these total tissue volume plots. And this shows the importance of using the full multi-site data to achieve a reference that isn't biased by individual studies. These population trajectories show the 50th centile line as well as the 5th and 95th centile lines for males and females after removing study and processing pipeline effects. These models had high stability under cross-validation and high validity against non-MRI metrics of brain size, such as postmortem brain weight across the lifespan. I think this is also a good place to stress that we stratified by sex for similar reasons as pediatric growth charts. Males have larger brain volumes in absolute terms, but this isn't associated with any clinical or cognitive difference, which is why, the the, why sex specific growth charts are likely to be more informative. One way our models extend previous work is modeling age-related changes in variants across individuals. For example, on the bottom left, we see an early developmental increase in gray matter variants that peaks at age five. In contrast, white matter variants peaks during the fourth decade of life and CSF variants peaks at the end of the lifespan. And in line with prior literature on this subject, variance in males is generally higher than variance in females. If we look directly at the rate of growth across the lifespan, for example, we see that the increase in gray matter from mid gestation peaks at age six, where the first derivative on the bottom left crosses zero. And this observed peak occurs two to three years later than the peak reported in prior studies that relied on smaller age restricted samples. Here's another way of visualizing the information about peak rate of change and peak absolute size. This plot shows the 50th centile for each phenotype for males with a solid line, for females with a solid line, sorry, and males with a dashed line. Cerebral gray matter is red, white matter is light blue, the subcortex is green and CSF is purple. And for each imaging feature, the circles show the age of peak absolute size while the triangles show the age of peak rate of change. Only gray matter volume peaks in absolute size prior to adolescence, but rates of growth in general peak much earlier in infancy and early childhood. And these early peaks in rate of growth haven't previously been well demarcated because data sets haven't really spanned the perinatal period, which was necessary for us to accurately model early growth. And it's been hypothesized that cellular changes are reflected in these neuroimaging milestones, even at the level of relative growth of global features. The initial postnatal increase in gray matter relative to white matter has been argued to be due to increasing complexity of neuropil and synaptic proliferation. Subsequently, gray matter declines relative to white matter, which is likely due to synaptic pruning and also continued myelination. But the exact timing of this gray-white differentiation hadn't yet been clearly shown, again, partly due to the lack of data sets spanning the perinatal period. Our models clearly demarcate this early period of gray-white differentiation shown by the horizontal gray lines in this plot. This period begins with the switch from white to gray as the majority tissue compartment in the first month after birth and ends when the absolute difference between gray and white matter reaches its peak in the fourth year of life. And all of this information can be explored interactively with the brain chart resource. 
If we go to charts on the top panel, we see the population trajectories with different centi lines. So this is showing gray matter and we can switch features. For example, the ventricles or CSF volume. And we can look specifically at age-related variants. Now I'll switch the phenotype back to gray matter volume and we can move specifically to look at the rate of change. And to look at a specific developmental window, uh, I'm gonna use this scroll bar to ignore all the adult data from the end of the age range to mid adolescence and zoom in on the brain chart prior to adulthood, showing the main charts above and the rate of change for males and females below. So this platform can be used to interactively visualize and further explore the imaging milestones I just described. And in addition to looking at typical development, a major goal for brain charts is to look at clinical alterations in individuals with neuropsychiatric illness. Brain charts allow us to take a study with both cases and controls and use the controls to model study specific variation, which then allows us to extract centiles for the clinical groups that leverage the full reference data set while also controlling for site specific technical confounds. One thing this framework does is allow for cross disorder comparisons between disorders that occur in different developmental periods, which is important given evidence of shared risk factors across psychiatric illnesses even those that don't necessarily uh, occur during the same developmental period. Relative to individuals without diagnoses, we found highly significant differences in centiles across diagnostic groups. Here I'm showing results for gray matter for seven conditions where there are more than 500 scans for multi-site data for each condition included in our data set. We see the results for males above and females below. And from left to right, we're showing Alzheimer's disease ADHD, anxiety disorders, autism spectrum disorder, mild cognitive impairment that may precede dementias, and major depressive disorders, and finally schizophrenia. And the circles indicate differences from the control median, and the asterisks just indicate statistical significance after a correction using false discovery rate. And notably, schizophrenia ranked second overall behind Alzheimer's in terms of the effect size of gray matter deficits when measured in terms of centiles. And of course, different mechanisms underlie the gray matter deficits observed across disorders. And in the case of schizophrenia, the cellular basis isn't yet fully known. But while brain MRI is part of the diagnostic workup for dementia with the potential to help discriminate between pathological processes, our results underscore the potential diagnostic yield through a wider scope of human diseases, perhaps, with, with the use of appropriate reference models. In addition to considering phenotypes separately, we generated a cumulative deviation metric, the centile Mahalanobis distance across all brain phenotypes, summarizing the cumulative deviation from the 50th percentile. A nice thing about this measure is that it can be readily scaled to incorporate additional phenotypes when as we hope they become available in the future. As we'd expect, this measure of centile deviation was consistently greater in patients compared to controls. One benefit of this measure is that it incorporates deviation in both directions. So for example, if you look at ASD in the gray matter plot on the left, you can see some evidence of bimodality suggesting some people with ASD have less gray matter and others have more gray matter compared to the control median, which is also consistent with prior literature. And both increases and decreases are incorporated into the measure of centile deviation, which is a potential advantage. And for this cumulative measure of centile deviation, Schizophrenia was third behind Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment in terms of overall effect size. And these, as well as other clinical alterations, can be explored using the interactive brain chart resource. If we go back to the data selection tool, where at this point we're only including uh, the CN group, which stands for control or cognitively normal, we can add other diagnoses from a wide range included in the available data sets. So here I've added ASD, schizophrenia, and Alzheimer's. Then we go to diagnosis or diagnostics, excuse me. And you can see the individual participant data with site and pipeline effects removed plotted against the reference charts on top. And you can see the group level distributions in box plots below, including on the bottom right, 
test of significance for the deviation from the control group. And this is for gray matter, but we could also explore other phenotypes by changing the phenotype of interest in this panel. And now let's move from clinical alterations to the incorporation of novel data and future directions. A key extension of the present growth charts is the estimation of centiles for data not included in the original models. What we want is for a novel study to be able to use our resource to derive centile scores for their subjects, anchoring the novel study against the full reference data set while controlling for technical covariates. Option A to do this is just to refit the model using the new data, but this has some serious drawbacks. First, just in terms of computational feasibility, it would require too many computational resources to be practical, especially as an open resource. Privacy restrictions are also likely to prevent the sharing of individual participant data in many cases where brain charts would otherwise be useful. So we sought another option, which I called option B here, and we implemented a maximum likelihood approach to estimate the study parameters of a new study, a study not already included in the reference model, using only the pre-derived model parameters, but not the individual participant data that went into the reference model. We tested the accuracy of this approach on simulated data and on four independent real world data sets. In the real data, the results from options A and B corresponded almost perfectly in terms of the centiles output from the brain chart models, suggesting that option B is a good approach, as long as there is enough data to robustly estimate the study specific parameters in the new data set. And simulations suggested a benchmark of about 100 scans in a new study to robustly estimate study specific parameters. So this may seem like a minor and very technical point, but the ability to use option B is critical because it's computationally feasible and also obviates many future privacy concerns. And in fact, it was possible to implement a fully automated version of this approach into the online resource. Once we're in the app, we can go to upload data. And the question mark here just reminds us to make sure the, uh, the novel data is correctly formatted. And then we can go ahead and actually upload some novel data, in this case from one of our computers. And after the upload is complete, you can visualize the new data the same way you could visualize data included in the original model. Here we're just switching to look at female participants. And we can also visualize diagnostic groups and download the centile scores for the novel data directly, allowing whatever use someone has um, that they're interested in for their own data. So with that, where do we see this work going in the future? Perhaps the most important goal is to continue to gather more data and more phenotypes. Early development in particular is an area where there's expected to be new large data sets available to be incorporated into models in the not so distant future. In addition, we want to move from the four global volume phenotypes to regional and millimeter scale measures of brain size and shape, including cortical thickness, surface area, and folding. This is achievable, although maybe not quite as straightforward as it sounds, because technical covariates are expected to have a more complex effect on some of these phenotypes. And we need to address this thoroughly to make sure that the brain charts are really usable. Another area of interest is in combined imaging genetic studies. There's been so much recent success in terms of psychiatric genetics showing risk loci for disorders. And a central challenge for imaging is to help translate that highly polygenic risk into neurobiological pathways. And a lot of the challenge there is on the phenotypic side of combined imaging genetic studies, optimizing the signal conveyed by imaging features. And we do have some preliminary data shown here suggesting increased measured genetic heritability, genetic heritability in centile scores as opposed to non-centile imaging features, which if this holds has the potential to increase the physical power across many contexts in imaging genetic studies. Another area of particular interest is risk trajectories, i.e. tracking individuals along their centile trajectories, where the theory is that brain charts could increase the sensitivity of assessments that track individual deviation from reference norms. Although our current reference models are based on cross-sectional data, we've shown that they can be used to track longitudinal variation for an individual over time in terms of their centile scores. And there's a high degree of stability in longitudinal centile scores for individuals without diagnoses, 
which is promising in terms of the potential to track deviation in at risk individuals. And that's the kind of work that needs to be done if brain charts are going to fulfill their promise to yield clinical insights in the future. So with that, I'm gonna wind down. I think I'm on track. I made, uh, made up a little bit of time. And uh, I hope I've introduced brain charts and their application to study typical development, as well as neuroanatomical deviations in clinical populations, uh, and some of our hopes for the continued development of the kind of interactive resource that I demonstrated for you today. I wanna thank all of our collaborators, especially the members of the Brain Gene Development Lab, our colleagues at Chop and Pen, our national and international collaborators, uh, and most notably, again, Jacob, Richard, and Simon, who led this work. I do invite you to read our paper, which again was a massive team science effort, including far too many people to think individually. And also please go to braintart.io and explore these data and models yourself and be in touch if you have any questions or if you wanna be involved in future iterations of this work. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alexander Block. That was really interesting. Uh, I think we probably have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, we started your slot a little bit late. So um, if people do have questions, uh, feel free to pop them in the Q&A. Um, let's see, I see uh, one question here asking, have you looked at data-driven phenotypes that cut across disorders, for example, the BSNP study? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, we have not yet done that, although it's definitely something that we're interested in doing in keeping with you know, work that we've done in other contexts. Um, it's at this point, it's kind of, um, you know, to some extent, it's not really true, but in some extent, you have the choice between going shallow and broad and going deep and narrow. And at this point, this resource is kind of definitely in the broad shallow category, right? So you could take these quantiles or centiles and kind of limit your investigation to a specific study where you have very deep, deep, deep phenotyping and use them in that context. But if you're trying to look at, you know, the, the broad cross-study data set, you're sort of limited by the lowest common denominator in terms of phenotyping uh, across all the studies to some extent. I should say, uh, Richard mentioned this in the chat, but I may have sort of made it seem like uh, you can download the centiles right now from the app. And we decided to wait for peer review to allow that uh, feature in the app. So you couldn't actually download centiles right now. I don't want to give a false impression. Um, and he also mentioned, I'm sort of uh, live, uh, I'm a live puppet here. Uh, I, um, yeah, I mean, one of the important things is that there's no, none of the uploaded data would ever be stored on the back end. So we would be able to kind of ensure the privacy of that data. If you uploaded your data in order to download your own centiles, we wouldn't be taking any of that data or looking at it and it would be completely protected. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's an important point. Um, let's see. Uh, we have another sort of question or, or comment suggestion uh, saying it would be interesting to map new potential RDoC domains onto the brain chart using consistent measures across studies. Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds like more of a comment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot. I mean, it's a I really completely impressive. agree with you. And that's, uh, and you know, it's, it's so great. I mean, this is and, you know, I think this is the kind of thing where, you know, I presented it a number of times now, and people have, thankfully, like a lot of their own ideas about how they could take this kind of thing and apply it to their own research. And that's really the goal. So yeah, no, it's a really impressive platform. And, and it seems like, you know, there's a lot more that could be included. And, and hopefully as you guys roll it out, people can start contributing both data, but also um, sort of backend contributions of how to incorporate all these other data types. Um, I have a, another uh, question just out of curiosity. I mean, it's, it's, it's again, such a huge undertaking. I'm wondering how you guys think about um, like anatomical normalization and how you uh, actually pull out measures from these anatomical scans and um, you know just what your pipeline for for going from a you know T1 MRI to the measures that you have and whether that changes at all with the different ages like are you using sort of age specific templates are you using templates at all like how how, are, how do you guys do that yeah that's another great question um, so we overall we're trying to sort of model the effect of processing pipeline that's one of the things we're trying to 
trying to do. Uh, but with that being said, we've definitely focused on FreeSurfer as a, as a processing pipeline. Um, and we've allowed data into the models under a few different kind of tiered uh, uh, systems. One is uh, getting data ourselves, in which case we process it all in FreeSurfer version 6.0. Um, but we also, um, or if it's younger data, uh, like from zero to two, we process it using infant free surfer. And um, we also allow data that other people ran um, with free surfer and they just gave us the output uh, in terms of phenotypes. Um, and we also, and this was particularly important for the fetal data, we allowed um, custom processing pipelines that led to uh, phenotypes that were harmonized at the, you know, at the, at the level of um, what the phenotypes are meant to capture. And I think that what that also sort of speaks to is that it worked for total cerebral gray matter volume and uh, constructs like that, but it would definitely be harder um, if you, and hopefully when we move to, you know, finer grain features. Um, there's a tension for sure, like between wanting to have consistency in the methodological pipeline across all studies and then wanting to use the best processing pipeline for the specific age range, right? Because especially in the younger ages, that's just not possible. And we've definitely, we've at this point, at least we think about it in terms of, you know, you, you want the best pipeline to be applied for the data. So it's kind of on you, on us as a sort of an attempt to to harmonize and merge all this data to use different process to, to allow different processing pipelines as opposed to saying, you know, we're gonna use the same processing pipeline for all data sets, even when it's not the best processing pipeline to apply to that data set. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, cool. I'm I don't see any more um, open questions at the moment. So I think in the interest of trying to stay somewhat on time, we'll move on to the next talk. But um, maybe Dr. Alexander Block can stick around for a few more minutes. If people have more questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A. So thanks again. Thanks so much. Great. Um, thanks again. Um, now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Kari Borner. Um, she is the Victor H. Ingwa, Distinguished Professor of Intelligent Systems and Engineering and Information Science at Indiana University. She's also the founding director of the Cyber Infrastructure for Network Science Center at Indiana. Dr. Boner is a curator of the famous International Places and Spaces Mapping Science Exhibit. Dr. Boner's research focuses on the development of data analysis and visualization techniques for information access, understanding, and management. So without further ado, um, please welcome Dr. Bono. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I was hoping to present in person, but if you see this, that means my originally canceled and then rescheduled flight didn't make it on time. So I'm sorry for this, but I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. I will share my um, screen. And I hope you can see, um, see a slideshow. I will present on registering, visualizing, and exploring biomedical data. And um, this is for the NIMH workshop on advanced statistical methods and dynamic data visualizations for mental health studies. I have been truly enjoying the presentations by other speakers, and it's also wonderful to have everything recorded and all the slides available. In my presentation, I will um, give you a brief overview of what the mapping science exhibit. I will then go over to biomedical data and mapping spokes, 3 million nodes and 30 million edges, a humongous effort to interlink public free open ontologies. I will then present on HubMap the ambition to map the human body, healthy adult body at single cell resolution, 33 trillion cells to create a reference atlas of the healthy human body. And I will also tell you a little bit more about the data visualization literacy framework, which my team has been developing since many years now and is actively teaching also in several courses, 
One of them I will also entice you to participate in, which is the Visual Analytics Certificate. And I would like you to empower yourself by making your own data visualizations. A little bit more about the Mapping Science exhibit. Some of you might have encountered that exhibit in public libraries and science museums. It's an ambition to bring high quality data visualizations to many different environments. And you, here you see it on display at the annual meeting of the Association of American Geographers uh, back in 2005, the very first year that we had the exhibit on display. And since then, it has been going to many places, including also the CDC Museum in Atlanta, Georgia, or Duke University in North Carolina. The first decade of the exhibit was all about maps, static maps, and each year we had many maps submitted and reviewed by an international team of experts, and then the best 10 maps were picked, and so after 10 years we had 100 maps. That's a lot of maps, and there's a lot of information displayed in them. And so there are a number of atlases now which uh, explain these maps in detail, and so you can actually sit down with a book in hand to explore them. In the second decade going on right now, we have interactive data visualizations, and um, some of you might like to explore those. And in total, we now have 100 maps, um, more than um, four times um, six, um, 24 um, macroscopes. And um, we also have uh, many, many display venues that um, we had the exhibit on display. Among those maps, you have maps of scientific collaborations here using Elsevier data. You have maps of NIH funding, and all of these maps are available online at scimaps.org. Um, you also have the structure of science, um, the very first map back in 2005 that showed all of the sciences. And you can now use that as a base map to overlay, for instance, where nanotechnology papers are where proteomics or pharmacogenomics papers are. So you can use this like a base map of the world to then overlay additional data sets. And all the information on how these maps come into existence are provided with the maps themselves. And I won't have time to go into details here. Um, you can map patents, um, US patents, and you can get to see how they draw on prior art and how they impact future work. You can map Wikipedia and try to understand in how far Wikipedia also captures mathematics, science, and technology. And there are lots of relevant um, Wikipedia entries on those three topics. You can, of course, also map the human disease network or the disease zone, as it's called. And this is an interactive data visualization from 2009, which still works. And so you're welcome to explore it in much detail. Or uh, we have mapped um, here um, the history of science fiction. This is a map by Ward Shelley. It's a hand-drawn map, and it's very much like Amazon. If you find a book you like, then those which are close by, you might also enjoy. And so again, if you go to scimaps.org, you can zoom in and um, find your next science fiction book to read. Going over to the macroscopes, um, you now have interactive data visualizations that are fed by live data. You have um, visualizations such as this one of London, where I should be now, but um, maybe I'm not yet there, um, which show you how different areas in London smell. It's called smelly maps. And it's using Twitter feed data to help you all understand what kinds of smell might exist in a certain area based on lookup tables. It also does sentiment analysis over tweets so that you get to see which areas in London are more happy, more joyful, more sad, uh, more trustworthy, filled with anger or anticipation or fear. And I think all of these um, linguistic um, techniques now exist and you can do this for um, customer data or for mental health uh, feedback um, data sets, but you can of course also do it for social media data streams. And so here you see the river with all kinds of different bridges and some of them are pedestrian bridges and they have very different colors than those which are used for traffic as well. Another team um, mapped the mega regions of the US. They used commuting patterns from before the pandemic. And as you know, some people used to commute two hours each way 
and they use these patterns to redraw the boundaries of the US states. And as you see, for instance, um, for Chicago, Gary, Indiana, which is in the northern part of Indiana, just becomes part of um, Chicago because so many people are moving back and forth. And again, all of these are available online and you can interactively explore them. This is an effort that involves many, many map makers and macroscope makers, but also advisory board members. And um, we have been proud to serve as curators for that exhibit for um, the last 16, 17 years now. And uh, again, the exhibit goes to many, many places. If you have a place which would benefit from maps, let us know. We are very happy to bring it to public places. Going over to um, more precision medicine uh, data sets. Um, some of you might have heard of Spoke. If you go to Spoke, UCSF, EDU, you will um, uh, encounter a very, very large network that captures the essential structure of biomedicine and human health for discovery. And this effort is um, aiming to um, get anyone access to this data in a way that is um, easy to understand not just to patients and caregivers and doctors, but also to biomedical researchers. And so um, the investigative team is uh, listed here. So major institutions are involved. And Sergio, Sergio Baranzini is a very, very great leader for all of us um, together with his other uh, co-PIs. Uh, uh, as part of this uh, team effort, we developed um, an explorer that helps you to envision or to visualize spoke, uh, 3 million nodes and 30 million edges, uh, which federates about 19 open data sets um, into a public common data set um, for health relevant knowledge. And if you click on that explore spoke uh, button, um, you go over to a visualization of the many different types of knowledge that are in that knowledge graph. So you get to see that uh, from disease, you can go to symptoms. You can also go over to compounds. You can go over to proteins. From the compounds, you can go over to food and to nutrients inside of these uh, food um, items. And you can then start exploring this uh, network. And the more connections exist between two types of knowledge or different types of nodes in this uh, exploration graph, uh, the thicker the link is. So as you see from gene to disease, there are many, many linkages. Um, you can then query this graph by, for instance, entering a food item and a disease, uh, let's say coronary artery disease. You want to understand what kind of food items are beneficial or not beneficial for that kind of disease. And thanks to a synonym up, lookup, um, you can type in heart and you will still get to go to coronary artery disease, even though it doesn't necessarily have heart um, as a term in this query. Um, you can then search for um, this pattern and um, you get to see a lookup of um, what entities are involved. So to get from food to, the, to a disease, you can either go through compounds or through genes. And Going on, you can then zoom in to the landscape uh, from the potato, and um, I'm very German and I love potatoes, so that's the query we choose, um, to coronary artery disease. Um, and again, you can get there either via compounds or genes. And you can then start probing this uh, knowledge graph in many, many different ways. Um, it seems to be beneficial to have two different types of nodes a little bit more and, and most humans are having a harder time understanding it all. But then you can, of course, go through multiple different nodes in order to connect those two types. Um, but then you might also have one of one type and multiple of another type. And this way you can query the entire knowledge graph. And you can, of course, zoom in very much like a Google map. And you can zoom in again to get more information ultimately. You can also then share that information with others. Um, this um, work, which was just presented, uh, requires that you lay out very large multi-level graphs. And so we recently had a Dutch tool seminar in Germany, and there is a special issue in IEEE computer graphics and applications coming out on multi-level graph representations for big data and science. So if you work in that area, please consider 
submitting. If you are interested in using these algorithms, uh, consider reading the papers as they become available in 2022. Next project I wanted to introduce to you is HubMap, mapping 30 plus trillion healthy cells in the human body, male or female. This is an NIH funded effort. Um, there's also a markup paper out that is listed here and it provides more information on the overall effort. The goal is to um, generate foundational 3D tissue maps of a healthy human adult body, again, male and female, to establish this as an open data platform that is fair to coordinate and collaborate with other funding agencies, programs, and of course the uh, biomedical research community at large, and to also ultimately support use cases that demonstrate the utility of this data uh, for advancing health and uh, biomedical research itself. As you see here, there are different um, tissue mapping centers, but also TDDs and RTIs, which generate data. The data is then collected. Um, there are many different assay types that need to get compiled and um, harmonized. Uh, then data is compiled into a, a human reference atlas and ultimately is served um, to the world um, so that anyone can get access, except for the sensitive data where you would need um, a login. Um, my team is part of the HYPE, the Integration, Visualization, and Engagement team, and I'm leading one of the two mapping centers. And so if we go over, you get to see that we have many different organs. Um, the latest count is 28 organs in the human body. So many of your favorite organs would be in that set. Um, and there are many different types of single cell and omics assays run. Uh, many multiplex spatial assays also that are then used for the atlas generation based on landmarks and also based on anatomical structures and cell types uh, that can also then serve as a pattern uh, that can be used as a landmark and ultimately so-called common coordinate framework is developed. And zooming into this so-called CCF, um, you get to see that we believe that the CCF must capture major anatomical structures, cell types, and biomarkers, but also their interrelations across multiple levels of resolution, so from the human body uh, down to the single cell level. That's a lot of scales. Um, and we are using functional tissue units, such as, for instance, here shown the glomeruli in the kidney, as a way to bridge between the whole body and down to the single cell level. We believe that the CCF must be semantically explicit, but also spatially explicit. And so we are working on 2D and 3D representations of um, major anatomical structures and cell types. And basically it's an anatomical atlas that you can run an API query again. It's a computable atlas. You can also identify certain cell types and ask what is in their vicinity and their immediate neighborhood you will be able to um, query this atlas for what cell types are commonly found in um, certain anatomical structures, given a certain um, sex and age group and disease versus non-disease, whereas HubMap is all focusing right now on non-disease. Here you see one of those so-called ASCT plus B tables that aim to capture um, the autonomy of anatomical structures, but also information on how cell types um, are typically located in those um, anatomical structures. And then ultimately these ASCT plus B tables are used to create AS autonomies and cell type typologies. And those are then crosswalked over to existing ontologies. And they're also used to then create a reference object library in 2D and in 3D that represents anatomical structures and cell types. Here you see a, a different representation of the ASCT plus B tables. We have the anatomical structures autonomy tree on the left, uh, the cell types um, typology tree is uh, in the middle, and then the biomarkers uh, from genomic and proteomic um, biomarkers, but also lipids and metabolites, and now also proteoform biomarkers on the right-hand side. Um, we also just published 11 organs in their 3D anatomical structures um, with DOIs um, online free, for free use by anyone to use. And you get to see that there, of course, is a correspondence between the anatomical structures in these ASCT plus B tables 
and the 3D anatomical structures in the um, 3D reference um, bodies. In order to facilitate the authoring and review and validation of ASCT BSB tables, my team developed the so-called ASCT BSB reporter. And um, this reporter is also freely available online and you can then hover over one of those nodes and you get to see how certain anatomical structures are connected to cell types and what biomarkers are commonly used to identify certain types of cells. And so we now also have a new release um, which supports search and table comparison. And there are a few new features that just became available. So check out the ACT plus B reporter. Also typically cell tissue samples are photographed um, like what you see here. In order to uh, make this more systematic and to support the registration of tissue across different organs, we developed the registration user interface, which you can use to uniquely identify not only the position, but also the AS and CTs that are commonly found in a tissue block. And so if you use the um, registration user interface, you can um, identify the size, the position, and the rotation of the tissue block and where it came from but also via collision detection, you automatically get um, semantic annotations and IDs crossed over to ontologies uh, associated with your tissue blocks. And we now have that for many different organs, four of them are shown here. We also get to see in the lower right hand part here, um, how different tissue blocks were extracted um, from here, uh, kidney and spleen. And you can then use that data in the uh, exploration user interface and you can zoom into the human body and you get to see the tissue blocks that were registered and you can select one and you can get to see that there are tissue blocks from HubMap, but also from the Kidney Precision Medicine Project. And you get some more information and you can, can click on one of those and go over to the Vitesse tissue browser from Niels Galenborg's team at Harvard University. How about medical school to explore these tissue sections in more detail? And if you want to learn more about um, the HubMap project and the new types of data that now become available, you can go over to the Visible Human MOOC, uh, which is a free, open, massively open online course, um, which um, has uh, many different learning modules that introduce HubMap, its data technologies, but also some of these interfaces I just showed. And some of the uh, modules are seen here. And this is a massive team effort involving not only many tissue mapping centers, but also a larger team here at IU. And uh, of course, we would like to thank all the patients that agreed to volunteer healthy tissue and open use of their data. So in the last 10 minutes, I wanted to introduce um, the data visualization literacy framework to you. Um, this is a framework we have been using and optimizing and refining over the last 15 years. I have been teaching data visualization courses at IU for 17 years now. And uh, when we started, there was really no general guidance um, for this, and it was hard to then teach it. And so over the um, many, many years um, here, we had an opportunity to uh, First of all, agree on um, different types that are needed, but also on names and terminology. Uh, specifically, we believe that data visualization literacy, the literacy to make and explain data visualizations actually requires that you are able to have real literacy, you are able to read and write text. You have visual literacy, the ability to find, interpret, evaluate, use, create images and visual media but of course also mathematical literacy. And we believe that you need to not only be able to read data visualizations, but you actually benefit making visualizations because it's only then that you truly understand how they come into existence and how they could be used or abused in some cases. So the framework also then focuses on reading and construction. Um, we take human perception and cognition into account we uh, try to build on prior work in cartography, psychology, cognitive science, statistics, scientific visualization, data visualization, learning sciences. There's really a lot of good work that has been done, pioneering works that should be used for such a framework. 
And we wanted to have a framework that's theoretically grounded, practically useful, and easy to learn and use. Plus, it needs to be modular and extendable because new algorithms, new data sets, new challenges, new use cases become available on almost a daily basis. Here is the development process. And in the interest of time, maybe I just introduce the framework itself to you. It has, um, the framework has two parts. There is the DVL typology, so just types and uh, instances and proper names and explanations and examples for each. And then there is the workflow process of how you actually go about making a visualization. So you have these seven types and you have the workflow on the right um, and you can then overlay these seven types here. So you have stakeholders on the left hand side, you have inside needs by those stakeholders. You then acquire the best data that you can afford or that you have time for or that you have a budget for and that you can get your hands on. It's really important to have good data. Um, then you have data scale types here. Then you analyze that data. There are different analysis types. You visualize the data that there are different visualization types that come with different graphic symbol types and different graphic variable types. And then you deploy your visualization. And again, there are different interactivity types. And then ultimately you interpret your visualizations. You might realize that one year is missing or there's some erroneous data in there, or you get really interested to zoom into an area. And so you need to get more data for that high resolution inset, so to say. And oftentimes, if you really did a good job as a data visualization expert, your stakeholders will have new questions. They will look at the data and they will see it in a way that they have never seen their data before and they will come back with new questions. And so um, by going through this process again and again and again, um, you have an iterative refinement of your data visualizations. And it's very important to understand that there is this operational, operationalization project uh, step here from stakeholder needs to what can be operationalized. Um, and at the end, your data visualization has to be translated back to stakeholders so that they know what the next action should be on their end. You also will see that um, the visualization types could be a map, could be a scatter plot, um, and then you overlay different graphic symbol types, nodes and edges here. And the graphic variables are used to size and shape and color code your uh, variables, graphic variables based on the data variables. And so we have developed a data visualization literacy framework, um, which makes it easy for you to upload data to then uh, make a visualization and then uh, pick a visualization type and then select a graphic symbol type and then also to select a graphic variable type. And so it implements the framework itself, helping students to understand how you get from your data variables to the uh, graphic variables. And so now deep dive into these um, seven types. So you have different inside need types. If you already know what inside need uh, you have, that makes it much easier to then pick all the other elements. So for instance, if you have a geospatial question, a where question, then Oftentimes, um, map-based visualization and geospatial analysis are most relevant. If you have a temporal question, a trend question, for instance, then temporal analysis is more likely your friend. And oftentimes, then graph visualizations are relevant. But also, in some other cases, you want to animate network growth over time because you want to see it, the evolution of a scholarly network, for instance. Then you also have these graphic symbols and graphic variables and everyone have some examples of those. And then ultimately you have the interactivity types. And so for the inside need types uh, and for all the other types we have um, built on prior work. So here you start with Chuck Tung in 1967 who identified four different uh, inside need types. And then there were many after him pioneering works that tried to bring order to all of this. And then on the right hand side you have the types of inside needs that are captured in the info in the DVL framework. Under number four, you have different visualization types, and I'm just exemplarily zooming into some of those. Um, so here you have charts, you have graphs, you have maps, you have trees and networks. And to be honest, it's not um, the case yet that experts would agree on this kind of classification. 
some might actually think that a pie chart is a graph. So there are still discrepancies among experts on this, but I think you have to bring order to the language and terminology before you can teach these things and before you can empower others. Um, we are also very adamant about the fact that it's important to agree on a reference system. So here you see different um, reference systems, for instance, a table, a graph, a map, and a network. If you have these reference systems, you can then see that all of them actually have an XY um, aspect to them. So you have a column and a row, you have X and a Y axis, you have latitude and longitude, and even in a network which is laid out so that um, there are few edge crossings and the distances correspond to um, similarity between nodes or to distances between nodes, um, still you can actually freeze your layout and you still then can refer to a node using X and Y positions. So as soon as you have that reference system, you can then overlay other data. And that's also shown here. So here again, in the lower part is the reference system, and then there are different data overlays, first the graphic symbols, and then the graphic variables. And so let's go look at them in more detail. Uh, you can actually take those two, the graphic symbols and variables, and um, try to understand what they are. First of all, so here are graphic variable types, you have position, you have form, you have color, optics, texture, and motion. And many of them are supported by today's data visualization tools, but not all of them. And you also know, we know from cognitive science and psychology literature, which ones are easier to distinguish and which, one, which ones are harder, and which ones are more accurately uh, distinguishable by human beings. So position, we are very accurate. Angle, not so much. That's why the pie charts are harder on us. And you can then take the graphic variable types and the graphic symbol types and create these tables. And you can even identify which ones of those um, graphic variable types are more qualitative or quantitative. And these tables are rather large. And so um, in the Atlas of Knowledge, you would get the entire set of details and all the examples if you're interested to learn more. And so Last but not least, I wanted to make sure that you saw that there is an entire course made for busy professionals to empower yourself and others to become more literate in terms of data visualization literacy. And so the next course uh, will start September 20th um, this year. And um, you will have different experts present to you different data visualizations. You will have your own My Project where you bring your own data and you visualize it in many different ways. And then you also get to um, work on this My Project at the very end and get feedback, of course, on the way from um, many of us. And so we had many US employers um, presenting um, this to their students. And, um, and we had the true pleasure to have um, students from the Boeing company, from uh, Lilly, DOE, CDC, and many others in this course, really helping each other also and creating wonderful expert networks um, that are still in existence uh, long after the course has ended. So please go to Visual Analytics, CNS, IU, EDU, and um, check it out if it is for you. It's a six-week course, and uh, we would welcome you. If you like books, um, there are now three atlases, the Atlas of Science, of Knowledge, and of Forecast. The trilogy is completed. And of course, there are quite a number of other books as well, including textbooks. So feel free to check those out as well. And I think um, I'm out of time now. Thanks so much. Um, and I would be happy to answer questions. Uh, again, if I haven't joined by now, please do just send it uh, to Katie, K-A-T-Y at Indiana, like the state, .edu, And I will follow up later on. Thank you all. Bye. Great. Thanks to Katie. Um, she. Uh, was unable to um, get here due, her, due to her delayed flight, unfortunately. But as she said, um, if you would like to contact her with your questions, it sounds like she would welcome them. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Lindsay Zimmerman. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Zimmerman, um, who received her PhD in clinical and community psych psychology at Georgia State University and then completed her postgraduate training at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And she's now a clinical and community psychologist and implementation scientist in the Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention at the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. 
She also holds affiliations at the University of Washington and Stanford University Schools of Medicine, as well as her position at the Veterans Affairs Palo Alto Healthcare System. And in Dr. Zimmerman's work, she leads research efforts which use participatory system dynamics to increase timely patient access to evidence-based pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy for depression, PTSD, alcohol, and opioid use disorder. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lindsay Zimmerman. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna hop in. And i um, really excited to pick up where the last talk left off with a, a use case that I hope will be interesting to folks. The talk here, Modeling to Learn, Test, Don't Guess, comes out of my work as an implementation scientist. I'm joining you all from Silicon Valley, California to talk about this National Quality Improvement Initiative in the VA and how we're encouraging staff at the point of care to test out their heuristics using dynamical and interactive uh, team resources. So specifically multidisciplinary teams of nurses, social workers, psychiatrists, psychologists, and so on. And I work with an amazing group of scientists and partners um, across the country that make this possible. If you're interested, I'll use my mouse to highlight down at the bottom under the purple map. If you're interested in a little bit more about who we are and what we do, you can check it out at mtl.how forward slash team. So as an implementation scientist, we're always wanting to reach more patients at the point of care with the research evidence that so many researchers at the National Institute of Mental Health and NIH in general work so hard to produce. And this open source comic from XKCD, you may recognize the pattern of vaccine results published by Pfizer earlier this year to combat our pandemic. And the joke is the tip in the caption, uh, always get data good enough that you don't need statistics. <laughs> Well, I'm not gonna bury our lead. I wanna kind of start with, the, with what we've been doing for the last six years and, and show some things in a static way in the deck and then you know show things in an interactive way at the end. And I know we're running about 10 minutes late, so I'll try to keep a good clip here uh, to cover this work. So first of all, these resources, Modeling to Learn, are effective by quality improvement standards. What do I mean? So if I just show this figure here, we've been looking at when we do these uh, interactive and dynamic data visualization exercises with these multidisciplinary mental health provider teams at the point of care in their outpatient clinics. Then if you look here where the y-axis is showing what proportion of the patients are getting evidence-based psychotherapy around these clinics, and you're seeing several years of time across the x-axis, this is statistical process control. So used to determine when you've brought a system process to sort of a new case. And of course, you'd normally be adjusting these upper control limits that reflect a, a three sigma improvement. So we're seeing that among other clinics that may share some staff and the same leadership in a regional healthcare system, clinics that use modeling depicted in the middle and right-hand panel, were able to, in some cases, double or triple the number of veterans, um, really in this case, it's, it's like a 15 fold increase and maintain that improvement over months. So just starting there, modeling to learn with interactive and dynamic data tools can lead to those types of real world effects at the point of care. I have to apologize for the Caltrain if you can hear it behind me. So my goal is to answer some questions during this talk about why we think this works. So what works to increase the reach of evidence-based psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy? Assuming uh, that most of us who are here today sort of are, are already in, involved in trying to make these data resources more interactive, more dynamic, I like to talk about pushing ourselves to think about who needs to be involved in developing these. And in particular, why participatory learning uh, works to upgrade decisions that healthcare providers, mental health professionals make in really dynamically complex environments. Because I know that um, I can't represent this entire process in this amount of time, I just wanna point you to a website that's available to you, mtl.how forward slash demo. If you use this course code here, NIMH 2021 data viz, all underscores, all lowercase, then uh, you can play around with this now during this talk. You can play around with it later. Uh, the code just keeps it open for longer 
for you. Um, so you can do that. Uh, there's information there. There's videos from veterans with lived experience in recovery talking about what they hope their providers will get from doing modeling to learn. And if you have any questions that we can't get to with the chat, I know I said we're running behind, email us mtl.info at va.gov and uh, myself or someone from the team will, will respond right away. So as we go through, I'm gonna answer the questions I outlined uh, for the audience, but I'm also gonna ask you some questions, assuming that we all know how important it is to make these tools more interactive and dynamic for people to actually get the insights they need. And so I just like to point out some orienting questions back that we've used um, to help people think about this. If say you haven't yet tried to measure whether people's interaction with your resources is working the way you intend, or you haven't scaled it at national production in healthcare, or maybe you haven't thought about the implementation science side of this problem before. Um, so I'm just gonna use these questions throughout to kind of encourage you and prompt your thinking. So for an implementation scientist, we have to think right away, what's our working definition of our mental health care problem? And uh, Dr. Borner talked about how problematic it is in terms of uh, graphic variables and our data literacy skills. Uh, to use pie charts, this is kind of like the typical pie chart of the implementation improvement scientist. The question is sort of how do we get more patients to our highest quality care? And in our case on our team, we're talking about evidence-based psychotherapies for PTSD, depression, alcohol use disorder, and opioid use disorder. If we cover those four presenting concerns, we're covering about 80% of the reasons that people come into outpatient mental health care. And we have very strong evidence-based pharmacotherapies as well as psychotherapies for those presenting concerns. And the question is why, depending on how you slice it, you might get only one to three out of one of out of three of your patients to that. By the way, I'll tell you, this is common in healthcare. This isn't unique to the VA by any means. And when I say depending on how you slice it, this is where dynamic and interactive data becomes important because we mean over time, we mean, do they get one touch? Like they've even had a possibility of getting exposed to this treatment. Do they actually engage in care over time in a way that would meet their need? These all involve the dynamic aspect or the time component. And most frontline staff don't have insights about how these things work over time in a way that they can access at the point of care in the clinic. So we also think modeling to learn is affected by implementation science standards, where the difference is quality improvement is, is it improving things globally overall in these local hospitals and implementation sciences, what makes it work everywhere? Could we create generalizable knowledge about how people can interact with these modeling to learn resources we've developed and could it work everywhere? And I just kind of want to show a few more static views that are better than the pie chart, but still not good enough. So you'll see if you're you know, studying dynamical systems, you're gonna see some really common behaviors here where I've taken on the left and we've put initiating an evidence-based practice like psychotherapy or pharmacotherapy on the y-axis and completing it. And if you know that you have um, an inability to wave a magic wand and grow staff where they don't exist in rural Utah or create hours in the day in a busy high volume clinic in St. Louis, then you know you're gonna see these characteristic behaviors of systems that include oscillations whenever there's a balancing feedback and a quantity that needs to be conserved. So you'll see some sites where they're just kind of peaking and troughing and they really have no insight into what is causing this because they've been flying blind. They don't have the resources that they need to understand these patterns and know when they should change course or even how to take those patterns and move it in a trend uh, that they'd like to see. And this is really disempowering. I mean, it's not only bad for patients, but I'm using another joke here from XKCD where the first panel says, I used to think correlation implied causation, took a statistics class, now I don't. Sounds like it helped. Well, maybe. And yet, as some of the other talks have pointed out today, um, these learners, these busy professionals need to understand whether something's likely to work to the benefit of their patients in their local clinic right away and they have limited time to get those insights. So I would encourage all of us, if we're hoping that more and more people will catch on to what we're building, think about who needs to be engaged early to uh, refine and codify those tools that you're building. How would you engage them and what makes it scalable and feasible for them? We concluded that we really needed to establish infrastructure 
for participation in co-defining problems in modeling terms, and that that would actually be something that, given that models are um, always an approximation, we would be doing for years, that we would just keep, continue to be moving toward better, better and better tools to upgrade these team decisions. And this really comes out of a participatory epistemology where if we're thinking about complex problems and we only have ourselves and our favorite colleague at the computer coding, we're probably missing some very important things that each stakeholder brings to understanding what um, the common dynamics of a system problem are. And so we worked in our project over the last several years, we still do this with all kinds of offices from policymaker levels to um, certainly provider levels. And we have a veteran advisory patient group and so on across all the disciplines to try to continue to further calibrate and refine and validate how these models can be used to improve care. We didn't do that in a vacuum. If you are not familiar with the system dynamics tradition out of MIT, I do recommend and commend to you Scriptopedia. When we started this work, I was not agnostic to the idea that complex systems probably needed lots of stakeholders in the room to select features and to improve uh, the dynamics that were addressed in the models. Um, but fortunately, especially for your early career as I was when I started this work, there are off the shelf scripts for how to develop models um, of system dynamics problems and so forth at Scriptopedia and I commend them to you uh, that you could apply to some of the problems you might be focused on in your work. And if you're curious about like what it looks like when we very first started that, I just will point out this paper from six years ago where we talked about the quantities that staff really wanted included in their models. So when we were trying to figure out how to reach more veterans with these uh, you know, evidence-based parts uh, practices, part of their concern was the places where patients were accumulating in undesired states of care, having extra stops. And as you can see here, they've even really focused on the difference between how they allocate their time like their clinical schedule versus how they allocate their time in terms of what they actually do. For example, consulting with each other, calling a caregiver if you're worried about lethal means, access to lethal means for suicide, um, and a number of other ways in which the quantity of time is critical to improving things locally and absolutely hard to access without computational power and interactive tools that show how things change over time. I think it's really important for us to be thinking about that end user of the model from the very beginning. So we're talking often about who will use these resources and what decisions do they make in what decision-making context. So are we talking about people that are responsible for patients? We are in this project. Um, and although we work with people from Washington DC on down, we're not focusing on the decisions they make about policies and, and dollars and so forth, but we're really careful to think through how learning from these interactive tools map to the decisions our decision makers can make. And most of the time, what people have in healthcare quality improvement is a bunch of retrospective data reviews that tell them how well they've been doing against some sort of benchmark or standard. And when people see something that they like, that's good. When they see something they don't like, obviously that's bad. When they have no idea what causes either, it's really bad. Because what happens is even when you see something you like in the data, if you don't know how it emerges over time, if you can't understand those causal feedbacks and dynamics that contribute to that system behavior in your team, even when you see something you like, you might be afraid to try another improvement and that can actually prevent any solutions. So we've developed both data user interfaces and simulation user interfaces, mainly related to the regulated data stores we use in terms of why they're not fully integrated yet into one platform. Um, and we encourage them to use simulation to try to explore all those questions they would like to explore about what if we tried this locally, what if we made this decision in our clinical practice. So if we're thinking about who needs that ongoing decision support, we really started getting local fast. So I'm not gonna read all the details of this table. I just kind of wanna highlight some ways in which the bold rows might differ clinic from clinic. You have a different demand for your services. You have a different local mix of providers 
Not all providers provide every evidence-based mental health service. And so you're always trying to take this dynamic, constantly changing local context. And it would be reasonable for clinic two to just doubt whether something that worked in clinic one works for them because they would be fully aware of what all these differences are, but they would not be made manageable or tractable for their decision-making. And so I really want us all to kind of keep going and just be part of the voice um, with all of you, because I know that's why you're here, about thinking about ways to make this accessible and transparent and why scaling it is important at the point of care, um, not just in our research grants, but even research grants that occur at the point of care um, in our health systems. So we want this to be empowering. We're trying to upgrade the decisions that healthcare teams can make. And why we think this will work, this is a adaptation of John Sturman at MIT's, uh, what he calls double loop learning. And if you're not familiar with this, I really commend the American Journal of Public Health paper uh, from 2006, it'll be in the references at the end, called Learning from Evidence in a Complex World. I'm just gonna give a quick overview. You may not know that they have been writing about graphical user interfaces, uh, plain English definitions of your partial differential equations, in the system dynamics tradition genuinely for decades. And the distinction that John Sturman makes is that it's really, really hard to make decisions when in the real world, you have all of this dynamic complexity and time delays between your actions and your ability to observe them. As a result, as a learner, I'm using my mouse work to trace here if you can follow it, I'm in the information box. In the real world, the cloud on the right-hand side means you have missing data, you have observations about some things and other things. With the delays, it's hard to know that the quality improvement initiative you did in the clinic in March explains what you're seeing in October. And something that should strike fear in all of our hearts as patients, but we know is totally true as providers, our providers are making decisions all day, every day by heuristics that may be flawed. So system dynamicists have cited Herbert Simon and his Nobel Prize winning work on bounded rationality and said, listen, without being able to upgrade these decisions safely via simulation learning, then it's really scary in the VA to make a mistake. When we have high risk of suicide, we have relapse and other chronic uh, impairments that are top of mind for providers, it's very scary to just learn by trial and error. But fortunately in a virtual world, you can control experiments. You can get complete real-time immediate feedback about the impacts of decisions, which is critical to learning and generalizing your learning. Much as we as children benefit from our pain receptor system's efficiency and telling us don't touch a hot stove. Oh, and maybe that generalizes to the campfire and to that hot radiator over there. This is what providers who are busy in a clinic need is complete accurate immediate feedback where no veterans or patients are harmed in order to make more correct inferences about what's likely to happen over time in their common, common problem. And that's why with modeling to learn, learning can be the goal and it can be safer, which for any of you who do clinical work in part of, in one of your hats, you may realize how disempowering the quality improvement infrastructure can be where it's evaluative and learning is not the goal. So we really started focusing on frontline teams making evidence-based practice care decisions. And we realized that learning from modeling conferred several advantages where people are not able to adapt to those dynamic decisions and they're not able to coordinate their mental models. And they're also not really able to evaluate their EBP specific constraints, like how much time in the day they have or how much staff they have to deliver a, a given EBP to a patient. So, we really encourage the teams to consider the physics of their own local problems, where the main constraint is their time. And so most teams, and I've adapted this slide because my mentees have told me it's helpful, but most of our frontline staff, social work, nursing, psychiatry, psychology, social work, I'm sorry, I said it twice, peer support specialist was the one I meant to add. It's not clear to them that you could generalize the same modeling infrastructure and same data sources and come up with a local solution. And I will often grab whatever's on my desk, whether I do actually have a stapler here, a stapler, a piece of paper and say, well, you know, we rely on this all the time. We rely on system engineering to help us understand how if I were to chuck both of these across the room right now, then they would land absolutely in different places. They would follow absolutely different trajectories. But the variables that I should account for 
in accounting for that flight path over time are the same. And we should be able to account for the differences in their math, their aerodynamics, and come up with insights that can help upgrade our decisions in your own team, in your own clinic. And in fact, we might be able to do it faster than just the really disempowering trial and error. And so it's empowering to think that something that's currently just feels bigger than you at the point of care in a healthcare system might actually be the accumulated result of your own decisions. It's just adding up to something that maybe nobody wants. And it's better to actually be able to get far more nuanced understandings of the trade-offs and trends and take that time scale of two years and rather than wait until two years have gone by and realize, oh my gosh, we've just got more turnover because we've just got more burnout because we've just got more inability to deal with the dynamic complexity of care here. And instead start to get insights about time-based patterns in, the, in a clinic meeting, in a staff meeting. So for example, here you can see I'm using the left upper panel and my mouse work to talk about the time between visits, frequency of return visits. And in this case, the red line here was talking about a team that currently wasn't able to get people due to low resources in for psychotherapy any faster than like 16, every 16 weeks, every four months, which as we know is not our evidence base for cognitive behavioral therapy, for prolonged exposure, any of our uh, evidence-based psychotherapies typically would want near weekly, or in some cases now, even a more intensive frequency of visits. So the question is, you know, we know it's gonna get worse, but how long would it get worse before it got better? Or how would it impact the other services? And those kinds of questions, most of our providers know the complexity of the problem, but they have really not been trained in understanding the dynamics. For those of us um, working in this space, I think it's really important for us to always look for those common data sources that can feasibly scale so people are not reliant on us in the future and think about very carefully what are the units that really matter to our decision makers. So in our case in healthcare, we benefit from looking at data sources that are common across all of US healthcare coming from the Center for Medicaid and Medicaid uh, care services. So basically, if you're interested in these models, you can test them, you can try them in your healthcare system. If you use common procedural terminology for encounters, you can use it. If you have a scheduling system that tracks time, you can use them. But what's really powerful for the team, again, sort of sticking with a static view for a moment, is being able to initialize this with local values and tell a system story about the states of care where patients accumulate and about the rates of change that govern the transitions between those states of care, thinking about complexity feedback and change over time. So what does that look like? Well, we have a lab notebook that everyone interacts with when they go into the user interface. And we always get and co coach them through this process of clarifying what learning question they have, their dynamic hypothesis. So if we made these new decisions in the clinic, then we expect this over time. And of course, what we're trying to do is move people from very simple linear cause and effect understandings to more complexity, to move from like stories that have a clean line, like a beginning, middle and end to stories where there's a loop. And so the beginning can come back and influence, uh, the end can influence the beginning um, as effects are reinforced or attenuated over time. And to really think in movies, as others have talked about today, rather than snapshots. And so we just guide them through this inter interface, uh, clarifying what they find and thinking about how they could upgrade some of the decisions they make all day, every day. So the theory of change that we're testing in two large multi-site national phase three cluster trials, let me say that again, multi-site implementation trials, um, and their phase three cluster randomized trials. So we're randomizing in our NIH R01 some sites to just get interactive dynamic data tools without the what if scenarios and the simulating the, four, the uh, two years ahead. So that key idea of being able to grasp what's likely ahead of us and what's the impact of our decisions, we're trying to isolate those what if, what if scenarios over time and instead just look at the value of the graphics and the visual interfacing with their local data, two-arm trial. And we're gonna be measuring uh, changes in system thinking among the staff. 
That's consistent with the system dynamics literature where there's lots of evaluation of the ability to increase your skills managing complexity, feedback, and system behavior over time. But there's also just the possibility that when you can go into an interface and interact with it naturally, then maybe you're just engaged more. And if you don't have pre-baked solutions set up by your auditors or your accreditation bodies or your quality improvement business office, if it's really something that you can use towards your own ends related to the stressors you have in your clinic, maybe that's just what's driving it, the ability to engage in a mutual learning process. And so we're actually isolating some um, other aspects of the user interfaces in our VA trial to test that out. I'm not gonna go through all of this, but I'll just kind of give you some snapshots before I kind of wrap up and show a little bit or see what questions we have. So we developed a secure website where teams could start to get a sense of trends over time. That's kind of where we begin in our partner phase. And then we start to ask them what types of questions they would really be bummed if there was all of this like Cadillac souped up technology and they didn't get an answer to. And usually what people know is they know the complexity, but they don't know the dynamics. So they'll have a question like, we know we should be getting more patients with opioid use disorder medications, but we only have some providers with these drug enforcement agency X waivers who can provide that care. It's a smaller population that we think should come back more frequently to assess for a therapeutic response to methadone or buprenorphine. And of course, the modal presenting concern we have around here is we have a bunch of veterans at high risk for suicide with depression and high risk um, for relapse with alcohol use disorder. And we've got the same set of providers in this town to deliver these evidence-based pharmacotherapies. So we know there's these trade-offs here. We know the populations vary. We know that how often they should come back to evaluate it, be evaluate vary, but we have really no way to develop a good insight about exactly what we should do with our local staff mix to serve this local community. And it's important that against this base case, the staff are able to experiment with a lot of different changes they might make. So we initialize the model with the local data, and then they experiment up or down uh, from the Bayes case to see what they think is feasible. And the exciting thing is, is that you can start to move people from sort of hypotheses that they have that are sort of scary to them. Like they, you might have a prescriber say, you know, I really know that we have an opioid crisis in the United States but um, I'm really, really, really burned out. And I'm very worried that if I start taking on more patients with opioid use disorder medication needs, that I'm just gonna be overwhelmed and swamped. And it makes me not even wanna think about this problem. I, I do like having some well-managed depression sometimes on my caseload or other fears. And so the nice thing about being able to explain things in terms of feedback dynamics and being able to explore them safely in a simulation is that you can kind of address those fears and help people think about those trade-offs and they might find a smaller or lighter lift makes a big difference. So for example, for this team, this is one of our real teams, they found that if they just reallocated about 20% of their x wavered slots from their depression patients to focus on medication for opioid use disorder, that actually some of their patterns due to all the balancing feedbacks in the system would actually even right back out over time and they could get through their backlog with a relatively smaller change than they feared. And they concluded basically exactly in this relatively small team, how Lindsay, many referrals they could get Sorry. over time. Two minutes. Yeah. Let me just check, am I muted? I'm hearing uh, Michaela. No, you're not muted. We can hear you, <laughs> okay. but you have two okay. minutes left. Thank you. And so you can see here, you know, you're zooming in and out on an entire flow of patients and trying to help them connect the causal dynamics to the system behaviors they produce. So wrapping up, I do want us to think about our long game about how decision makers will interact with these things. One of the things I was um, finding was that the biggest sell was that people could find these insights faster with simulation learning. And so we developed a 12 session plan that's now accredited by all those disciplinary bodies in psychiatry, psychology, social work, and so on. And we basically don't join a team huddle twice a month for six months to walk them through interacting with their data, learning how to tell causal system stories and running through a number of decision scenarios they'd like to try to improve what's going on in their clinic. 
And I think for many of us, what will be sort of the state for those of us who already know how important interactive and dynamic data is, is to clarify not only what needs to be in those graphic variables or what time dimensions and units need to be accounted for, but exactly how we expect people to interact with them and what we think will be happening for them in those cognitions and to stake a claim about them in our NIH grants and in our research so that we can develop generalizable knowledge about how they work. So I mentioned the trials I had earlier, and I know um, Michele mentioned this in his, his opening today. We did for this R01 submit one of those two minute interactive videos showing how this worked um, for reviewers to consider, and it was funded. I do think it helps for people to see that quick dynamic interaction. And I'm just calling out for you these two aims here where we're really trying to, to test whether that participatory learning from simulation is shifting uh, the heuristics that, that providers are using to accomplish um, and account for more dynamic complexity over time and greater engagement uh, with the visualizations that we produce. So to that end, if you do have questions about this, um, I would encourage you to check out that mtl.how, knowing, I mean, I'm happy to answer what ones we have here, but um, go to the demonstration website, log, log in there, check out all the guides. We've been developing this on GitHub Open Science for years. So all of our deliberations, even ones from yesterday are available for transparent review. All the code is downloadable. The models are downloadable. Um, our guides for facilitating folks, the accredited guides are all available uh, for use by anyone. And if you just want like a really quick view of like that partner build and apply view of how to get folks through this process and really try to focus on shifting those heuristics. You can also just watch videos at mtl.how and, and see what, what you see there. So on the one hand, some of this may feel like you're, uh, we may feel like we're really trying to capitalize on new computational power and new capacities for visualization and interactive dynamic tools. And that may seem very innovative, but in fact, at least in many of our applications, when we think about the stakes of just hard work, trial and error in the real world, we're probably glad that our surgeons have simulation uh, training before we get under their knife, that our pilots have simulation training before we get in the plane. And it makes sense that similarly, some of the insights about these dynamic complex care problems in mental health also benefit from looking before we leap and helping the team of providers to share a mental model that accounts for dynamic complexity over time. With that, I wanna thank all of our funders, um, all of our team members. Um, I'm going to leave up a couple of key slides of references while I, I get to the questions. And I do have the tool queued up in the background uh, to show anything that people may have, if we have time for that. But I do know uh, we are running a little bit late. So um, I'll take my cues from the other panelists about, about that. Thanks Thank so you. much, Dr. Norman. Really, really great talk. Um, I think we are running really out of time, but you can answer the question live on the on the chat Q and A thing. Uh, but we'll probably move on to the next speaker. But thanks again. Wonderful talk. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, it's with great pleasure I introduced our next keynote speaker uh, and my golden mentor, Dr. Lucina Dean. Uh, Dr. Dean is an associate professor at the University of Miami where she directs the Brain Connectivity and Cognition Lab. She received her PhD from UCLA and completed her postdoctoral training at the Child Study Center at NYU. Before joining Miami, she was a faculty member here in our psychiatry department at Stanford. Uh, and her current work is focused on understanding dynamic network interactions underlying cognitive inflexibility in neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism. But without further ado, please welcome Dr. Lee. Thanks, Manish, for the introduction. And uh, thanks, Michelle, for organizing this. I've already learned a lot. And thanks to the other organizers. Um, today, I wanted to just share some uh, thoughts about data visualization for network neuroscience. And uh, just checking, everyone can hear OK? Before I, OK, yeah, let's, yeah, let's hope so. so. OK, yeah. great. Um, so when I was uh, thinking about preparing for this workshop, um, just this month, there was a, an article in the New Yorker um, that was a little bit sensationalized, but it was really um, interesting. It, it talks about when graphs are a matter of life and death. So it's really um, talking about the importance of, of data visualization and 
Um, here we see a, a figure that was created in eight, back in 1824 that is supposed to be the first time series graph that, that we know of, um, at least you know, plotting the prices of, of different things over different, uh, different quarters. And it was just uh, showing that like, you know, at some point someone had to invent this type of graph. Like we didn't think about time series data in this way of visualizing it. And in fact, when it was first introduced, people didn't know what it was and we had to really walk everyone through what this visualization meant. And um, so these things, you know, take time for people to ad adapt, adopt to and to understand. Um, but in this particular article in the New Yorker, they talk about how things like the, the train schedules and the, the ways that trains uh, you know, go across tracks you know, has been plotted out. This is a plot from 1878 um, and basically showing how you know, it really avoids them crashing into each other if we can visualize them in a way that lets us know what's happening when. Um, and I thought another nice example came from uh, race car driving where um, they, they can often um, you know, plot instances of when engines fail versus the temperature outside. And you know the red dots are showing you know incidents of, of damage or destruction in, in you know race scenarios, but um, if you didn't plot the blue dots there, which are uh, instant, uh, uh, those are when um, no accidents happened. Um, you can see which temperatures uh, outdoors resulted in no accidents. You know without plotting both the sort of positive data and the negative data, you might miss an important point about these relationships. So I thought it was a nice um, you know introduction to the topic of data visualization, you know, how it's sort of, um, we may not necessarily see how important it can be in different aspects of, of really life and death as this article nicely points out. Um, but in the case of, of network neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience more broadly, which is where I work, I wanted to think about why data visualization is particularly important for us. And I think, um, you know, to convey things like anatomical specificity, where exactly in the brain are we talking about um, dynamics and time varying properties of the brain, which, um, which I'll definitely get into, but really uh, knowing that the brain isn't sort of a static organ, it's um, <laughs> doing things at millisecond and second and minutes um, in terms of the time scale and, and trying to really capture those as a challenge for, for data visualization. And of course, it's a three-dimensional structure. And, and any time you try to map a three-dimensional structure into a two-dimensional space, something is lost. So how can we get it back? Or what's the best way of, of retaining the three-dimensionality in, in our depictions? And finally, complexity. The brain you know, with something like over 100 billion neurons is not going to be something easy for us to plot. Um, no matter what we do, we're going to lose something in the data reduction. But, um, but there's still ways, as we've seen in the talks all throughout the day, there's still ways of keeping information on, we're getting better and better at this. So I think that's, that's uh, a positive development. There was a paper from Vince Calhoun's group a few years ago talking about data visualization in the neurosciences, overcoming the curse of dimensionality. Uh, and there was some nice um, uh, figures in that paper uh, talking about, you know, going well, how you can convey more information uh, on, you know, from means and standard deviations. You can con convey more information using things like violin plots than VAR plots. And uh, since this paper was published, I think about 10 years ago, I've seen more and more, you know, as an editor and as a reviewer of papers, I've seen more and more people really opting for the more rather than less information like box plots or the violin plots, uh, which give you more information about all the individual data points that went into a chart. So I think the field has largely adopted these practices um, already. Um, these are just some ways of displaying activation maps on brains. Instead of just showing something above a particular threshold, there's ways of, of showing the gradations and the variation um, you know, uh, in the plot you can see on B. And of course, error bars and confidence intervals and all of these things are more and more, I think, almost expected in our figures. And I think that's obviously a positive development and if the goal is to convey more and more information. And there's a nice um, chart here in that paper where they're talking about some suggestions for improving clarity and completeness, um, you know, sort of not trying to hide anything in the data as we've as we heard about in earlier talks today. And there's just some very good recommendations in this paper um, you know, how to convey uncertainty and how to use colors in a way that, you know, is, is easiest for interpretation. Um, and the funny thing about it is that as neuroscientists, we are not 
usually experts in data visualization. We're not even very good at science communication, or maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but you know, we're not trained to do this, but we have to do it. We have to um, put figures in our papers and our grants and in our talks, and we have to communicate our science. So, um, you know, it does behoove us to take a little bit of time to think about these issues, um, because if we can't convey the information, we really are at a loss. So there's another paper that was um, out about a few years back um, that looked at data visualization for inference in tomographic brain mapping that talked again about um, you know, the advantages of different ways of viewing brains. And of course, you will have to sacrifice precision in order to, um, you know, sometimes in order to increase interpretation or uh, you know, it's sort of a trade-off at many times when you're trying to decide how to depict an activation, for example, whether you give it a slice view or a whole brain view or a glass brain view. Um, and there's again this um, discussion about uh, you know thresholding and, and what that reveals and what that hides. And another table that um, you know gives an overview of uh, the different ways of showing um, sort of brain findings and um, how you might want to, of course, tailor your approach to visualization based on what you're trying to convey. Um, that you know there's not a one size fits all uh, exactly approach for any of these things, as you can imagine. Um, I always like to use this figure from that uh, Daniel Margulies created. Uh, I like to use this figure when I give talks um, because it just highlights something that we know from single unit recordings, we know from EEG, and we know from fMRI that there's a whole lot of spontaneous activity that the brain um, sort of produces. And there's this is in particular showing the low frequency fluctuations that contribute to um, what we call nowadays resting state functional connectivity. And the idea that you can see the recapitulation of brain networks that we know to be involved in cognitive tasks like memory and attention and uh, vision and motor processes, all of these networks that subserve these, uh, these things are actually uh, coherent in, in the resting state. Um, and so you can see that really nicely here. And these kinds of visualizations, you know, whether they're time elapsed, whether they're sped up, convey something that you cannot possibly convey, I think, from a static image, even if you have a series of images showing the change, the, the, the gradualness and the anatomical specificity and everything I think is really best conveyed by movies. And so I, I was excited to see, for example, um, you know, Tim Barron talking about how um, this kind of movies can be embedded in papers at eLife and um, this, these kinds of movies, as Michelle mentioned, you can, uh, you can, I didn't know that you could submit movies as part of grants. Now that I know that everything I submit from now on is gonna have some kind of movie in it. Um, not just because it's cool, but because I think it conveys more information than the static image ever could when it comes to thinking about brain dynamics in particular. Um, our lab studies, how brain networks develop from childhood and adolescence into adulthood and how that supports cognitive development, um, particularly uh, processes like um, executive function and, and cognitive flexibility. So, um, the ch you know, anytime you're trying to convey change over time, all the issues we've talked about during this workshop um, about uh, visualization are, are, I think, even more pertinent. Um, you know, the field of human connectomics, if you want to call it, uh, has particular, presents particular challenge for visual, visualization because we have all of these dimensionality curses, as we talked about. We have just um, many, 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 points, many, many, many parts of the brain. Um, oftentimes we're taking our images and we're already making a bunch of simplifying assumptions. So instead of the hundreds of thousands of voxels, uh, which are each a data point in their own right, as Manish mentioned in his talk, there may be ways of getting back to, to recovering all of that data. But by and large, we're actually summing over large brain regions, um, perhaps using an atlas, some type of parcellation that someone has agreed upon to divide the brain into these kind of um, anatomical or functional areas and then doing summaries to look at how those particular areas change in their activation levels over time. Perhaps we then go on to depict this as a connectivity matrix where we're looking at, at each brain region by each brain region and how strong, for example, the correlation is between two, any two given brain regions. Uh, this connectivity matrix that you see here um, is something that you'll see in now hundreds and hundreds of published papers. And sometimes, uh, 
you know, we don't even really describe what's on the matrix. We like it, the labels are too small on the Y and X axes for us to see what brain regions are actually being referred to. So, I mean, I think we, we have a long ways to go as far as, um, you know, making sure we, <laughs> we actually do our visualizations in a way that conveys the information clearly um, without, you know, too much room for ambiguity. But I'm saying all of this that like we have a lot of challenges in visualization for network neuroscience. But I think we're um, you can see uh, there's a lot of people working to to make you know kind of really beautiful and clear pictures that show what what's actually going on. Um, and then in in connectomics, we often do these analyses, um, um, network kinds of analyses where we treat each brain region as a node. We treat each, we can treat either a functional or structural connection between two brain regions as an edge. And of course, all kinds of metrics can then be computed um, on those, uh, those um, graphs at that point. And you can, uh, on the right, just showing some things like path length, you know, how, to, how many you know, links must be traversed to go from point A to point B is one metric, you know, clustering coefficient, you know, how tightly clustered is a particular uh, node in a network and things like rich clubs and hubs and, and all of modules. Um, all of these you know, concepts are, are now sort of widely applied uh, in, in network neuroscience research, but um, the visualization of them is just really critical for um, conveying what the findings are. And so uh, I think um, the more we spend time you know, getting that right, the better our insights I think will be into these network structures of the brain. So I think it's worth spending the extra time as it were um, to get the visualizations right. Um, if you were old enough, you might have seen images like this, or if you'd look back on papers, neuroimaging papers, published PET and fMRI papers from the late 90s, early 2000s, the output of the SPM software looks like this. It puts on a glass brain the, um, you know, the activations, the contrasts of interest. Here's basically, you know, some task fMRI result. And this was what people did. This, these are the figures you would see in a paper, um, you know, and you, your guess would be as good as mine, uh, exactly what brain regions were being um, activated by the tasks here. And of course you'd have the tables uh, showing the peak, um, the clusters and their coordinates. But it wasn't long ago that this was our <laughs> sort of state of the art for making a figure for brain imaging. Um, so obviously we've come a long way and, um, and it's, it's nice to see how many tools there are, how many different ways there are now of conveying the full um, scope of the information from a neuroimaging study. Um, this is not very recent. This is something I did, I don't guess 10 years ago now, but um, you know, when I was a postdoc and I submitted a paper here, just trying to show there's functional connectivity differences between two brain regions that are adjacent to each other. But um, the reviewer came back and said, um, I had shown some surface maps and the reviewer said, if you're talking about brain regions that are hidden in the sulcus, you really need to show a flat map. And I thought, great, now I have to spend like another two weeks learning a new software, figuring out how to make flat maps and, um, you know, that was a lot of, at, me, at the time, I thought that was a lot of work, but the truth is like nowadays, there are so many tools that make these things easier. Um, at the time I used a tool called Carrot, but there are many, many um, different software packages that have been developed to let you look at the brain in these different ways. And some people rightly so will insist that if you don't use a flat map, flat map you know, depiction to visualize areas in the sulcus, you're missing out on some important information. So. I've come to that sense, appreciate that reviewer's insistence that, um, you know, I learned that. Um, but this is also a figure that I was using a lot um, is from a paper uh, that was uh, published by Sir John and colleagues at Stanford in, uh, a while back now. Whoops, going the wrong way. But um, I used to use this figure a lot in many of my talks because much of the work I started doing during that time, um, you know, was a starting, this work was a starting point for a lot of the work that I was doing. But what it's doing is showing um, Granger causal analysis, uh, inter, basically interactions between brain regions, causal interactions between brain regions. Uh, the, the networks are sort of labeled by colors, um, blue for what's called the salience network, uh, yellow here is the default mode network, and um, green is the, what's called the central executive network. And these are just showing you know, causal interactions between the brain areas of these networks in a task-free resting state um, during auditory event segmentation task and during a visual audible attention task. And I use this figure a lot in, in talks. Um, 
but then at one point someone gave me some advice, I think, uh, I don't remember who it was, but I should really thank them, about how you don't have to just use the figures that are in a paper in your talk. If you want to simplify them, you can actually make them again um, the way you want um, to make a point in your talk or to be consistent with some other overarching theme. And at the time I'd started doing studies on these same brain regions as well. And I started using BrainNet Viewer, um, a MATLAB based tool for showing um, all these interactions between brain regions on an actual brain surface. So I remade his figure um, to use in talks and it looks better, I would say. <laughs> like in, in a sense, like you can see where the brain regions are that we're talking about. You can see more clearly the anatomy of the networks and the interactions between them, how consistent some of these findings are across task and rest. But um, just, you know, just remaking someone else's figures, uh, that was like, uh, a flashbulb moment for me. I didn't realize that you, you could do that as a scientist um, because your goal here in the talk is data visualization and science communication. It's, um, you know, I think it's, it's okay to realize that sometimes we often simplify results when we're trying to, you know, present them to the public. So I did this, you know, going forward. Um, if I saw a figure I wanted to include and I wanted to make it you know, look a particular way without losing too much of the detail of the findings. I would just, you know, make them again in some software that has since been developed. So, um, you know, this is all sort of part of what we what we do and maybe, um, you know, to make things clearer to our audiences. Um, there's a lot of, you know, work in developmental cognitive neuroscience and developmental network neuroscience that really benefits from some of these dynamic visualizations we've talked about. Um, Damien Fair published a paper a number of years ago showing um, differences in whole brain network structure from childhood through adolescence into adulthood. And the, the static figure is, of course, you know, nice for conveying the point that, um, you know, graph structures change over development. But he also has in supplementary materials a lovely video that shows you how this actually happens from, from the young age, you know, the eight-year-olds up through the you know, the adults, and you can kind of see um, where the nodes of the different networks change affiliation and how they, um, you know, result in a more segregated system, uh, you know, over the lifespan or over that early part of the lifespan. And I really like this because um, it's more fun to watch in some ways and also uh, really gives you uh, a better sense for, um, you know, how these, these brain regions kind of uh, change their um, connections. Over, over a period of time. So, you know, when we can do these things, even before we had some of the tools we do today, uh, I think they added a lot. But in the past, of course, they were all relegated to supplementary materials. And we're hearing now how there's maybe ways to embed them in, in the in, um, primary publications. Um, we also, you know, of course, have seen these kinds of figures um, over and over again, you know, just brain maps looking at, uh, you know, functional connectivity of a particular brain region and negatively correlated brain regions. This is from Mike Fox's um, you know, seminal work. Um, I like this figure that comes from one of Thomas Yeo's uh, papers in uh, 2011, I believe. But here he's just you know, basically taking a seed region of interest and moving it around and showing you how functional connectivity uh, changes you know, gradually and in interesting ways. If as you go across the cortex, and this is, you know, not only is it fun, but it, it gives you a feel for um, for really like how dramatic um, there are changes across some particular borders, for example, and how there's more smooth transitions and gradients of functional connectivity at other points. So um, visualization is just fun and games, but it really does like give a, a better way of understanding what's going on in terms of the neuroscience. Um, and while I'm at it, I'll just show another one of Thomas's great visualizations. He has this tool for data exploration um, and in one of his 2014 papers um, where, you know, on the left is kind of a static image and on the right, if you go to the website and you click on one of those components uh, on the edge of the circle, it changes um, dynamically to, to show you, you know, what's unique to that particular component. So it's any user can get on the website and, and play around with that. And it's really um, a better way in some ways to understand what this really complex data set is showing. Um, these are some images from uh, a paper that my, one of my former graduate students, Taylor Bolt, is currently working on, where he's look, talking about traveling waves of activation across the cortex. And you know what better way to understand these what he calls 
uh, he and Shella Kilholtz called quasi-periodic patterns. But um, you know, what better way to visualize them than to um, really have a movie uh, that tells you what's going on at a particular point in time? You can see you know transitions between particular um, brain states. You can see um, you know how long a particular configuration persists. And many other things. I'm just not doing justice to this uh, paper, but it's on BioArchive if anyone is interested in checking it out. But um, it, it's a tool for data exploration and oftentimes lets us see commonalities uh, across different, um, different uh, tools that we might not have seen otherwise. So um, I'll, leave, I'll leave the details of this out for the interest of time. Um, I, when I was, you know, tweeted about, I have to give a talk on data visualization. A lot of people offered up some nice images that I could show for this, so I appreciate that. This comes from Farouk Gulban, who's talking about um, cortical flattening and has some um, software here to do that. And you can see how really uh, nicely that, you know, conveys some of that information that's, that's not, you wouldn't know from a static image. And this is another example of uh, data visualization from Eduarda Zampieri, um, which also, she also kindly provided this in uh, response to my desperate tweet. Um, so, you know, to sort of learn how to do this, I was impressed to find how many free tools there are online. Um, on Coursera, there's like something like 700 different courses. I'm sure one of them would be relevant for what we would want to do. Um, there's all these, uh, you know, different uh, universities. I think both Stanford and Harvard have data visualization courses online, and I'm assuming that others do as well. And um, these are some of the tools that uh, are that I used, for example, in some of the images I showed you earlier. Um, Brain Net Viewer, you know, many of these things can be find, found on GitHub. Uh, there's just too many to list. MRIcon has been around for a long time, but um, there's so many that I've just left out of here. But we all know that if we do a little bit of searching, we can find ways to make our figures um, better. And the final thing I wanted to mention is that sometimes the, the the figures we make for our paper, uh, their art, I mean, they end up being visually very stunning and beautiful. And in recognition of this, um, the Organization for Human Brain Mapping many years ago started the, uh, the Brain Art Special Interest Group. And every year has a competition for um, you know, people to submit their, their beautiful images in, in a very creative forms. But um, there's even a, a category called beautiful mistake, where you know if you use software and you made tried to make a figure for a paper, but you ended up making a mistake, but it looked really cool. Um, you know, you can submit that as part of the competition. And I, I think part of what we do, um, it is art when we're, uh, it's graphic design, it's um, all of these different components and the, the kinds of things we end up with are right, really quite beautiful. So um, I think we should sort of be proud of that art that we're creating for our figures um, when we're doing data visualization for network neuroscience. So since we're um, out of time or close to out of time, I'll just say thanks. And um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Christina. This was a very impressive view of the field of neuroimaging and all the data visualizations that like uh, you, you, you presented, like you really a very, you made a very good impression. Um, so that said, like I want to thank uh, all the uh, organizers and all the speakers. I learned a lot today and I was very impressed with uh, all the uh, presentation so far. Um, I want to also thanks, thank uh, all the attendees, like we had uh, over uh, 1,500 uh, registrants and um, from all over the world. And um, I wanted to uh, just uh, let you know that we have like a break and we will come back here at 2.15 Easter time. And uh, during that time, we will have uh, the tutorials. Uh, so if you want to learn how to do this beautiful uh, visualization of some of them, uh, you are more than welcome to join us. See that Janice and Manish are online. And uh, Jeremy, all the, the did this uh, organizer team. Uh, and Emily, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Michele. Thanks, Michele. All right. Thank you.